affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Murder. At midnight. A sealed book. Presents Suspense. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once again, I invite you to sail with me on a mysterious voyage into the unknown, unexplored country of the human mind. To be fair, it must be said that the mass murder of millions of human beings was not invented during our century. But to be accurate, it should be noted that in our generation, massacres, holocausts, and wholesale slaughter in general has been developed into what might be considered a fine art. Certainly, the atrocities that ancient, uncivilized barbarians committed in paroxysms of superstitious passion have been performed in our day with an almost impersonal and scientific objectivity. Is this better or worse? Or does it matter? Trust him. Trust him. He'll save us. Save us? How? Your, your grandfather is old and sick. We have no weapons. My grandfather will save us. Now look, there are a hundred soldiers coming up this hill. Can you see them? I see them. You see us, too. Have no fear. Have no fear. In a, in a minute, we'll all be dead. My grandfather will save us. Believe me. Why? Why are you so sure he can save us? Because he promised. He... <laughs> he promised... Oh, dear Lord. Maybe, maybe we'd better surrender. No, no. Trust my grandfather. He always keeps his promise. Well, then what is he waiting for? Have faith. Have faith. Our mystery drama, The Golem, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Lansing. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are times in the history of the human race when things become unstuck. The glue of morality melts under the intense heat of hideous pressures, and men are no longer tied to a rational society. Suddenly, the world is ruled by madmen, and human beings are arbitrarily divided into two groups, the hunters and the hunted. The year is 1943. 
We're in a cottage in the thick woods that surround a country town in a vast wilderness somewhere in Central Europe. The man is a forester. He is sitting quietly before a pleasant fire. His wife is telling a bedtime story to a sleepy child in a crib. And so the king said to each of the suitors who came to ask for his daughter's hand, all of you are handsome and all of you are strong, but the one who is chosen must also have a good heart. He must be kind to the poor and he must protect the weak. Shh, I think she's asleep. <sighs> now I can heat up your supper. Just imagine, Tom Chick, I was able to get beef today. Think of it, beef. I'm not hungry. You, you're not hungry? Tom Chick, what, what is the matter? Nothing. Oh, no, 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 something's wrong. I don't want to talk about it. Eat your supper. You'll feel better. I'll never feel better. I was in town today. Yes? And in the square, there were soldiers, Germans, the Nazis, that... They'd rounded up about a hundred people. Jews? Yes. And they were shoving them into trucks. Why should we care? They're taking them away to kill them. Well, it's war and... Do you know what I did? No. I did nothing. I don't understand. What were you supposed once, to do? Once I saw a man who was whipping a horse, an old <laughs> sick horse. Do you know what I did to that man? Tom, Jack, please, you, you're only going... And good. all he was doing was whipping a horse. Oh. And today in the square, I... I did nothing. All of us, we just stood around. We all did nothing. Most people pretended that nothing was happening. Tom, Chick, please. Let me tell you who was there. I'm not interested. A very old man with a long white beard. He was standing next to a young girl. I, I just don't want to hear anymore. Standing quietly, very quietly, looking straight ahead. And it so happened that his eyes looked straight into mine. Please, Tom, Chick. His eyes, they asked me for help, but I... I turned my head away. I denied him. No. If, if you've done anything, anything at all, you'd be dead. Who, who could that be? I don't know. Man, I, are you sure you didn't do I anything? I told you I did nothing. I'll open it. Who are you? It's the old man and the young girl. Please, please, may we come in just to get warm at your fire? My grandfather... And he's very sick, and he needs... Please. Oh, a little water, just a little water, oh, and a piece of bread. Young girl, young girl, please, I, I want to help you. Oh, God bless you. But I can't, I can't. Please don't ask me to. They'll burn the house down, they'll, they'll kill us. Just let my grandfather get warm. For a oh, no, 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 please don't come in. They'll find out you were here. Please don't destroy us. Have mercy on us. I'm sorry I disturbed you. Come, Grandfather. There is no one at home here. Tom Jack, what are you staring at? Did you see the old man's eyes? Now, Tom Jack. How those eyes looked into mine. I tell you, I, I won't listen. And for the second time today, I denied him. <laughs> You haven't touched a bite. Please, you worked hard all day. You must eat. I think I'll go for a walk. Now? Yes. In this weather, but it's crazy. Now, look, you listen to I think to you've me. said enough for one day. <gasps> Open! In the name of the fear of... What's this? Come, Nick. Let me do the talking. Please, let me do the talking. Open! Yes! Yes! I I'm coming! Good evening, Lieutenant. <laughs> that is the Lieutenant's insignia, isn't it? As if you don't know. <laughs> We're looking for two escaped criminals. Criminals? An old man with a white beard. A girl about 20. What, what crime did they commit? Tom, <laughs> <laughs> check. What crime? <laughs> You're a funny one. <laughs> Tom Jack, this is no time for your joke. The soldiers are here on serious business. You say you haven't seen them? No, uh, 
No, Lieutenant. Then you should have no objection if we search the house. <laughs> well, why should we object? Inside, boys. Uh, that, that, that staircase leads up to the attic, and uh, uh, this trap door is for the cellar. You are Tom Cech Masteric? The forest? Yes. Yes, he is. And, and um, I'm his wife, Marina. You've seen no one all day? No, sir. Well, those vermin can't go far. What will you do with them if you catch them? You mean when we catch them? They've given us too much trouble already. We'll just shoot them. Oh, excuse me. I had noticed you have a little one. <laughs> yes. Asleep there in the crib. <laughs> boys, boys, move about more quietly. <laughs> oh. She is a little princess, isn't she? Yes. She'll be five in November. You know I have one. She'll be four. Her name is Olga. Really? Mine is called Helga. It's the same name, you know. Uh, boys, there's no one hiding around here. Form them up outside, Sergeant. Uh, <laughs> Won't you have a glass of wine, Lieutenant? Oh, no, not on duty. Uh, what is your husband's name again? Tomczyk. Tomczyk, I need your help. My help? Oh, he, he, he'd be thrilled to be of service. They say you know these forests better than any man living. He knows every tree. I want you to come with me. Me? Do you have any objections? I need a guide. Oh, You'd know every likely hiding place. Oh, you certainly would. And if you can find them for us, there'll be a handsome reward for your work. Oh, Tom Check doesn't want a reward. That, that's just the knowledge that he's doing his duty. <laughs> you know, Tom Check, my wife is like that, too. I can never get a word in edgewise when she's around. <laughs> well, let us go. What do you mean now? Now. <laughs> Yes, Tom Jake. I would suggest we go no further. Why? There's no moon. The terrain is getting too treacherous. Is it? We've got gullies, ravines. A man can fall and break a leg. You wouldn't be trying to frighten me, would you? And why would I want to do that, Lieutenant? Or maybe you don't want to find them. They're nothing to me. <coughs> That's one of your men. Sounds like Stryker. Sergeant, get some men over there fast. Well, Tom Check, you may have been right. I can't see a thing out here. Is the Stryker all right? Yeah, he's right. We'll have to carry him back. Sergeant, bring everybody close to the path. We're heading home. Tom Check, what chance do they have to survive out there? None. Well, we'll make sure of that tomorrow morning. Cigarette? Uh, no, no thanks. Oh, go ahead, take one. You know you're dying for a smoke. Well, keep the pack. Plenty of cigarettes. Yes, plenty of good food, good jobs. Four sensible people. Tell me something, Tom Check. Are you a sensible person? I... Yeah, have a light. What is it, Tom Check? What's the matter? Oh, the matter? As I struck the match, I could see your face. You had a uh, funny look. As if you were in pain. Oh, and, well, I, I have this arthritis. Uh, oh, 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 well, so do I. But from the look on your face, yours must be pretty bad. Oh, uh, yes. Well, get some sleep. Tomorrow could be another long day. Lieutenant. Lieutenant, do we... Do we have to keep looking for them? Do we have to? All you do when you find them is... Shoot them. Perhaps. In a day or two, they'll, they'll be dead of cold and hunger, anyhow. Oh, you're back. Did they. Think... No. I have something nice and hot for you to drink. Take off your coat. Why are you just standing there? Shh, shh, shh. I want to make sure. I want to make sure the Nazis are gone. Why don't you take off your coat? I'm going out again right away. But where? I demand to know where. There are two people who need help. But you just I... said they didn't find them. That's right. They didn't. The Nazis didn't find them, but I found them. How? How could you? 
the lieutenant and I, we'd, we'd stopped to light a cigarette. He was facing one way, and I another. And the flare of the match I could see near a tree in the darkness, in the face of the old man. You saw the old man? It was only, only for a moment, but that moment was as long as eternity. His eyes burned into mine. The pleading... Don't you... Please listen to me. Shh. Once again, I turned my head away. And a voice whispered in my ear, a voice I had never heard before, whispered, This night, you shall deny me three times. Marina, I have denied him three times. I cannot deny him again. <laughs> easy it is to believe in brotherly love when your brother is lovable and respectable and acceptable. But what do you do about those brothers who are hated and hunted, who have every man's hand turned against them? Well, that's when you find out what you really believe the hard way. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Tom check. Her name is Marina. They live in a great mountainous forest that covers much of Central Europe. Around them swirl distant echoes of the greatest war in history, and yet their lives seem but little touched. True, almost every night they hear the drone of liberators, Lancasters, and B-17s. But their small town is hardly ever hit. And true, there are people who are being ruthlessly exterminated, but as Marina keeps reminding Tomchek, it's none of their affair. And it wasn't. Until tonight. Tomchek, what what are you saying? I heard a voice. No, no, no. A voice that said... Oh, please, I'm frightened. The voice said... This night you shall deny me three times. And I have, I have. What are you going to do? I need blankets. No, no, no. Food. I won't let you. Something inside it's, it's me is witchcraft. making... witchcraft. The old man, he bewitched you. No, no, you and I, we don't believe in that. All right, all right. You can't help yourself. I know. The voice keeps telling me I must go out there. I know, no, no. Let me help you. You want to help me? Yes, I'll, I'll get a rope. I'll tie you to the what bed. What are you talking I'll about? I'll be able you... to hold you here. Let me. No, no, please. Come, Jack. Will you I'll get out of my up. way? No, I'll leave this place. I'll save myself and our child. Come, Jack. Oh, Lord, save us. <laughs> Old man, you're here. I know it. Will you trust me? I want to help you. Where are you? You have to be here. I want to help you. No, 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 no. Don't be afraid. If, if you need to kill us, do it quickly. Shh, I've come to help you. Why? Because well, the old man, where is he? You can't just let him lie on the ground like that. I don't have any more strength. Well, he'll freeze to death. We have to get him to his feet. Come on. Come on, old man. Oh, he's unconscious. We must make him walk. Let him die. In peace. No, he's going to live. For how long? Who knows how long anyone will live. Here. Here, put this blanket around his shoulders. And take this one for yourself. Come on, old man. We must walk. Where? To a hidden place. It's a place I know. It's a cave. Oh, bless you. Do you realize how much you're doing for us? That's no, not very much. I remember once I did more for a horse. I never thought I'd be warm again. You were less than 500 yards away from this cave. 
the smoke from the fire. Will, will somebody no, see it? No, no, no. There's nothing to worry about. This cave is my secret. Here. Drink this hot. Oh. Grandfather. Shh, let him sleep. He'll get better now. I saw you earlier today in the square. How did you escape? Well, you see... Oh, I can tell you. I know it. I, I can trust you. My grandfather is... was a, a chemist in Prague. Yes. When the Nazis took over, he, he was afraid that, that they would force him to work for them. And, and, and so he, he went in... Well, we went into hiding, and, and it's been that way. Running from place to place. That's almost five years. How did you manage? There were all sorts of people. Some were kind enough to help us. Others betrayed us. But you got away. Well, the officer in charge of the convoy, the, the lieutenant, mm -hmm. he, he kept looking at my grandfather. Why? He must have recognized him. Grandfather was, was a very famous research chemist. Yes. He'd been working on a formula that... Would release explosive forces m much, much more powerful than dynamite. No, I... I'm afraid I don't understand. I'm not very educated. I'm only a peasant. <laughs> I don't really understand it either. It, and I've been to the university. But he is afraid that they could torture him to working for them. So... So he said to me... He said... Yes? He said... Let us try to run away and... And then they'll shoot us and... And that way, it'll be over quickly. But how did you run away? After we left the square, they, they drove us to the edge of the forest, and, and the truck had a blowout, and they ordered everyone off of it. Well? Grandfather took my hand, and... and we walked toward the woods. What do you mean, just like that? At any moment, we expected to hear shots and... and be killed. But nothing happened. How do you account for it? Well, I, I suppose they didn't think anyone would dare to escape, and they were so busy yelling at the driver for his carelessness, and so we just kept walking. Rebecca. Rebecca. Oh, yeah, he's coming around. Rebecca. Uh, is that your name, Rebecca? No. My name is Rachel. Rebecca. Where are you? I don't understand. He... He doesn't know anyone named Rebecca. Rebecca. Uh, oh. Grandpa. There you are, child. G Grandpa, don't you know who I am? Of course, my child. You're Rebecca, daughter of my oldest son, Ezra. Grandpa. Don't you know who you are? Child, what are these questions? I know who I am. I am Solomon ben Isaac, rabbi of Prague. Uh, where is the book? The book? The book. It was sent to me by my old friend, the Spanish rabbi. The Spanish rabbi? You know him. Moses ben Maimonides. Maimonides? Grandfather? Maimonides has been dead for more than 700 years. And in this book, he speaks of a golem. A golem? How it is possible to create a champion to make out of clay a man of irresistible force who will come to the rescue of, of oppressed people. Uh, golem. Oh, grandfather. Uh, I, I will create such a champion, and he will rescue our people. <laughs> now, child, you must not disturb me. I must close my eyes and think. Yes. Yes, grandfather. Oh, his mind is gone. It's gone. What? What was he talking about? Oh, a legend. A, a medieval Hebrew legend about a golem. It must have been the golem of Prague who saved our people once during some troubled times. A legend? 
a creature made by one of our wise men, but I, I don't understand. I, you don't have to understand the legend. He thinks he's a 13th century rabbi. He was never interested in history. Rebecca! Uh, yes, Grandfather. I will save us. You see, I'll save all of us. I promise. <laughs> Child, I have never broken my promise. Oh, I was scared out of my wits. I, I thought you'd be caught and shot. Well, I wasn't. You found them, I suppose. Let's not talk about it. That, that's... Yes, I know who that is. Let him in. <laughs> As if we have anything to say about it. Don't despise me, Tom Check. Is it so terrible to want to live? Uh, oh, Lieutenant. Good morning. Uh, a cup of coffee, Lieutenant. Oh, never on duty. Well, Tom Check, ready? Yes, sir. You look as if you didn't even get to sleep last night. Oh, well, oh Lieutenant, sometimes he's just restless. Here, take these, Tom Check. Oh, what's in the package, Lieutenant? Pills. Pills? I stopped at our dispensary. I got you some pills for your arthritis. Tom Check, but you don't have arthritis. Uh, yes, I do. Oh, what are you talking about? Since when do you have arthritis? Well, I... Uh... Ah, well, maybe he's had it since last night, eh? Tom Check, we must be off to the hunt. Oh, Lieutenant! What do you mean, Marina? Uh, but Tom Check isn't at home. He uh, isn't? Well, uh, you, you didn't tell him you'd, you'd want to come Yes, that's right, I didn't. But uh, I haven't come here to see Tom Check. No? No. I want to see you. Come, come in. Thank you. Uh, I want to help you. Help me? First off, Tom Chick told me a lie. A lie? About what? About having arthritis. Oh, oh but he, he does. Oh, he does. No. Yes. No. Now, it's a minor thing, a silly thing, but he told me a lie. Why does a man lie? He lies because he's nervous and frightened. Why should Tom Check be nervous and frightened? Because he's doing something wrong? Something seriously wrong? Like what? Like hiding fugitives? You see how simple and logical it is? But, but Tom Check wouldn't, you, you know. He, he could. He, he could. would. He could. He is. For three days now, he's been leading me all around the woods. There isn't a trace of those two. Oh, but... He's got them hidden away. Otherwise, how could they have disappeared so completely? Oh, Tom Check would, would never... Marina, you're his wife. You love him. And right now, you're the only one who can save him. But, Lieutenant... Quiet. Shall I tell you how you can save him? <laughs> And suddenly a word, a single word, sears itself into Marina's consciousness. The word is betrayal. How can something she has yet to find out be a betrayal of someone or something that is very important to her husband? And just as he heard a voice in his heart, she also hears one now. A voice that says, one of you shall betray me. I will return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. It's 1107. There are times when it seems that the Lord sleeps and the world is abandoned to the will of the wicked. And during such times, perhaps the wisest course. Perhaps the only course is to survive, to endure, to wait for a long night to end, and to hope for a new day. But meanwhile, one must live. And right now, a young woman named Marina 
whose home is in Central Europe during the Nazi occupation, is listening to what she must do if she is to live. Marina, I need those two prisoners. But Tom Check doesn't... No, you mustn't pretend you don't know Tom Check is guilty. Lieutenant, please. Uh, uh, but... don't, don't, don't cry. Tom Check, being Tom Check, would sooner die than betray them. But Tom Check doesn't know... No, no, we... no, no, no. We must not go back to the beginning. We're past all that. Therefore, you must find out from Tom Check where they are hidden. And you will find out in 24 hours. Or do you know what I will do? I will shoot Tom Check. You hear the noise, Rebecca. The noise, Grandfather. Uh, uh, the noise of the mob in the streets. They're, they're getting ready. Ready to kill. Grandfather. Try to rest. Uh, rest? Uh, now? Uh, the people, they must not make the same mistake as last time. They must not try to barricade themselves in the synagogue. They should come out here to this cave, an excellent hiding place. And besides, the golem can be more effective out in the open. The golem? Yes, child. I can make a golem. But that's impossible. What you wish to say is that only God can make a living creature. Huh? Uh, that's true. But the golem is not a living person. The golem is a force. Yes, grandfather. Yes. But now rest. A man-made force. Uh, where is Tom Check, the young peasant who is so kind? He will try to return. Uh, could he get me some salt, some clay, and some... Yes, yes, uh, yes, Grandfather, whatever you like. Now, please, rest. <laughs> Mm. Oh, my poor Tom Check, you've fallen asleep over your dinner. <sighs> yes, Rob. I'm so tired. Ah, oh, it's too much for you, Tom Check. I have to go out. Please, please. Marina, right, I'm sorry. I must do this. Now, don't try to talk me out of it. But I don't want to do that. If what you're doing is important to you, it must also be important to me. And so, well, I must also be a part of it. I want to help. No, it's too dangerous. I must be a part of whatever you do, Tom Check. Don't you understand? I, too, must help. Marina, I... Marina, I love you so much. That old man, he must be terribly ill. He is. Well, he needs good nursing care. Now, you know I could do that. Would you? Where is he? Tom Check. Marina, you... God, you look so beautiful right now. It must be because you feel beautiful. Where are they hidden? Where? Marina, once I tell you, I... Will you become a part of it, too? Where, Tom Check? Do you know the cave? The cave? Now, have you forgotten? We found it that day when we went walking. We went inside. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember. Now, the old man is terribly sick. He needs you, Marina. Well, now, first, first I must go to town. To town? Why? Well, there's Olga. I'll take the child to my brother's house. Oh, of course, she'll be safe there. And uh, then I'll stop for some medicine. And Tom Jack? Yes. I love you. I know. Oh, Tom Check, you'll never know how much. How is he now? Quiet. He talks to himself. Oh, I'm frightened. Oh, now most people talk to themselves. No, no. He talks to himself in Hebrew. Well? He has never learned Hebrew. He doesn't know it. 
Are you sure? Yes. And from what I can understand, it, it's a kind of medieval Hebrew that hasn't been spoken in hundreds of years. Now, how would he know it? I don't understand. What is that? I... I, I don't know how it's to all explain. Over the, all over the floor, all the way back in the cave. What has he done? Well, he... He took the clay that, that you brought him, and, he, and he, well, he's he's making. He's, it's in the it's in the form of a man. Yes, he he he's been making a golem. Whatever it is, it's it's like a giant. Where where did he get the clay? He made it from the that that you brought. I didn't bring all that much. <laughs> yes, it's it's frightening. It it. It seems to be growing. I, I can't believe my eyes, but there it is. Grandfather, please tell us. Be what I... quiet. But grandfather, sir, what is that? I am about to write down certain words, certain awful words, and in this place. There must be silence. The silence of the dead. But you promised. You promised. And I shall keep my promise, Marina. You have my word. You'll even be rewarded. Well? They're, they're hiding in a cave. A cave? You must do better than that, my dear. You, uh... You pick up the pathway just past our house. And you follow it north for two miles. Now you come to a deep ravine. In front of you is... Is what looks like a wall of solid rock. But it isn't. No. Because when you climb to the top of it... You will see the entrance to the cave. Thank you. Sergeant, place her under arrest. But, but you said... I you... said you'd be rewarded. <gasps> At this point, I don't know how. If you're lying, a firing squad will give you 30 leaden oh. bullets. If you're truthful, there. There are 30 silver kroner. <laughs> Too quiet. It appears to be in a trance. I wish I knew what to do. No, it's, don't be discouraged. Marina will know. She, she was studying to be a nurse. But her parents lost their money. And she'll help. Oh, bless her. Yes. She's really a wonderful person. She worries a lot, but... In the end, you can depend on her. Maybe. Maybe what? Maybe... You and your wife should just... Yes? It's, it's not your fight. Yes. Yes, Rachel, it's my fight. It always was my fight. Will you fight with me? I don't know how. Yes, you do. Children! Children! Oh, thank the Lord. He looks better. Children! They have come for us. They have come. Oh, Grandfather... Just be Listen, quiet. outside. Around it. Pull back. Look down. Look down, the Nazis. They're climbing up the rock. They know where we are. They know we're here. Come check. Come check. We know you're there. Come down. Oh, Tom, check. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you. I can hold them off. One man with a rifle can knock them down one at a time. We'll hold out till dark and we'll, we'll try to run for them. No, Tom, check. It's no good. And I'm so tired. No, no, don't lose courage. Tom, check. Save yourself, Tom, check. Tom, check, you're a sensible person. There comes a time, there comes a time when... When what? When, when he no longer hears our prayers. When he says, my children, it is your will. Do with it whatever you will. Destroy yourselves in your own madness. I abandon you. Rachel, Rachel, you mustn't say that. Grandfather, 
Grandfather, let us save Tom Jack. Let's give ourselves up. Grandfather. Grandfather. Behold, my children. Behold. The thing. That thing he made is moving. The people shall be saved. The murderers shall perish. Grandfather, what have you done? We have been sent a champion. It's a giant. The champion shall smite the mad killers of the innocent. Grandfather. I have written the awful, never-to-be-forgotten words. I have breathed the force of life into the champion. Clay giant is moving. Clay no longer, but fire and steel. Look at it. You look through me. It has acquired the force and power of a million sons. He shall burn away the evil that surrounds us. And I charge you, champion, avenger, protector, call him. Go forth. Go forth. <laughs> destroyed them all to the last man. What what was it? You saw a golem. Where did it go? It vanished as if into thin air. The pious old folks still believe. Oh, and they assure you that the golem will reappear one day when someone shall awaken him to save the people. What is that you're saying? I, oh, I, I remember reading the story of the golem. Rachel. Rachel. Grandfather. Uh, oh, my head. I, I had the strangest dream. I dreamed I was living hundreds of years ago and and I, I was who is this man? Where have I seen you before? Come, grandfather. We must be on our way. Where where? Where? I I am so tired of running. We will join the partisans. It's time we stopped running and started fighting. Is there, was there, a golem? The question is, what is a golem? A thing of irresistible force. Well, so is a bomb. A British or American bomber flying overhead may have dropped one. On the other hand, the old gentleman was a scientific genius. He could have made one. Or it could have been what you heard. A golem. I'll be back shortly. There is a legend that a medieval Hebrew scholar created a creature of great strength and power to rescue his beleaguered people from the madness of a mob, a creature called a golem. It is significant that the word golem means unfinished, and this is fitting because to save the world, we can only depend on a certain amount of help to be given us. The rest of the effort must be 
our own. Our cast included Robert Lansing, Mildred Clinton, Patricia Elliott, Ralph Bell, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'll always remember how she looked. She was almost pretty when she had that shy smile on her face. But would it be murder? If all I did was help her to kill herself? She had this insane affinity for a lethally poisonous snake. Sooner or later, she would release him from his cage in the mad delusion that he was her dear friend. Would it be murder? No. It isn't murder. Look at him. This enormous monster coiled in his cage, sleeping. No one had seen me enter this house of crawling, murderous creatures. Here on the side is the latch. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Dr. John Forrestier. Henry, Henry, you blew in Forrestier's head. Sure, I saw the coat. It was Dawn Forrestier's, that's for sure. Had her name stitched in it. As beautiful a piece of sable as a poor newspaper reporter ever looked upon. Yeah, and her other clothing was there, too. Underneath the coat. Aloud, Clara. It is believed that the beautiful Dawn Forrestier has been murdered. This morning, several hours after Dr. Forrestier reported his wife missing, Sexton Rolf Griggs of Green Cedar Cemetery found a bundle of clothing inside the cemetery gate, which has been identified as belonging to Mrs. Forrestier. Oh, golly. In the burial ground. Oh. Readers of the Gazette will recall the dramatic circumstances which have surrounded Dawn Forrestier since early this year. She was discovered one morning in the spring 
Wandering in the park near Longview Hospital by Dr. John Forestier. Sure, I remember. Read all about it. She was a victim of um, 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 amnesia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that means you can't remember who you are or where you came from or anything. It tells all about it here in the Gazette. The doctor took her to the hospital. Yeah. And he named her Dawn. Uh Uh-huh. And and fell in love with her and married her. They never discovered who she was. Uh, It says here, it was thought at the time the beautiful woman who later became the bride of Dr. Forrestier might have attended a masked ball or came from the stage. But no such person was ever reported missing. Sure. Don't you recall it, Clara? She was dressed in an old-fashioned gown, torn all to tatters. Yeah, and now she's disappeared again, as mysterious-like as she came. Oh, gee, ain't it awful. You know, Clara, I kind of got it figured out. I'll bet she was the mall of some gangster who bearded her way and murdered her. She murdered. Probably cut into a hundred... Gentlemen of the press, I have called you here to my home tell you that you need not continue your search for Mrs. Forrestier. What do you mean, Doctor? Uh, not to continue the search. Uh, what's the dope, Dr. Forrestier? Have you located her? I think perhaps we have. Well, where, where is she, Doctor? Where did you find her? Uh, please. Uh, what are you going to do? Please, gentlemen. What, where... If you will kindly allow me to do the talking, or rather, if you will permit Mrs. Forrestier to speak. Well, then she is here in the house? No. My... My wife will speak to you through a letter she left behind for me. I only discovered it this evening. For you see, she had placed it in a volume of verse from which I often read to her. Oddly enough, I had thought I would never want to open the sonnets from the Portuguese again. It was against my will that I turned to it this evening. Perhaps guided by dawn. Who knows? Who can say? It was here I found her letter to me. What well, what is in the letter, Dr. Forrestier? I'm about to read it to you. There will be a few passages I will omit. They are personal messages meant only for my eyes. But here is the story of the disappearance of Dawn. My darling John. This is going to be the most difficult and tragic hour of my life. For in this letter, I must say farewell to you, my devoted husband. The story I have to tell you, John, will be so strange and terrible that at first you won't believe it. But as you remember me, as you recall the circumstances of our meeting, how you found me dazed and wandering in the park one spring morning, how we'd never known who I was or where I came from, Then you will give more credence to my story. You named me Dawn because you found me at sunrise. Boris, dear, because you love me. We met in the dawn, my darling. But I must creep away from you in the darkness of the night. Oh, John, how I've loved you. And yet how disturbed I've been since I've lived here with you. I've tried to keep it from you. But your analytical mind and keen eyes have often noted my condition. You've repeatedly said... What is it, Dawn? What's wrong? Why, nothing, darling. Why? You know, dear, I often think it must have been during the night time that you were mistreated or abused by someone or something which brought about your amnesia. Why, John? Because it's always in the night time that you appear nervous, disturbed. Oh, John, you're imagining things. It was not you, John, who was imagining things. It was I. At least at first I thought it was a product of my imagination. It happened for the first time a few days after we returned from our honeymoon and had come here to live. You had left my room. I had turned off the light by my bed, prepared to sleep. First, I thought I must be dreaming. From a distance, I heard a singing wind like the opening strains of a melody played on an organ. Something quickened within me. I seemed to know the melody. I thought to myself, everything is going to come back to me. I shall know who I was before I became Dawn Forest here. I listened intently. 
And then as I was listening, my outer bedroom door seemed to light up. Yes, that's it, to light up. I sat up in bed. A street light shining through my window made the the thing that materialized against my door very discernible. I could see that it was something phosphorescent. It glowed and shimmered in the half light. Then I could see that it was taking a shape and form, the form of a human being. For many seconds, I looked upon it too frightened to speak. Finally, I got out the words, What are you? There was no answer. When I spoke, it disappeared. In the morning, I was convinced I'd dreamed it all. But the next night, the same thing occurred again. Once more, I was aroused from a half-sleep by the music of the wind. The second time, the glowing figure seemed to be closer. I spoke again. Who are you? This time, the figure didn't vanish so quickly after I'd spoken. It lingered a few seconds and then faded away like a picture on a screen. This materialization occurred for seven consecutive nights. It was then, John, that I asked a favor of you. Remember? John? Yes, darling? Would you think it too bold of me if I asked if we might go away for the weekend? No, darling. I wish we could. I've noticed how nervous you've been the last few days. I'm sorry, dear. I don't know what it is. Don't let it distress you, Dawn. You're not entirely well, you know. Maybe some time before your nerves stop playing tricks on you. You're so helpful to me, John. I wish I might grant your request to go away for the weekend, but my work at present makes it impossible. Oh, it's all right, dear. It was only a suggestion. I'm really all right, so long as I have you. You had said it would be a long time before my nerves stopped playing me tricks. Oh, this was something to cling to. It was silly of me to get upset. No human figure really materialized in my room. It was my nerves playing me tricks. But the visitation didn't stop, John. Hearing the singing wind, having that glowing, shimmering thing appear in my room was continuous. And then came the thing that struck terror in my heart. This night I had fallen asleep. Again, the music of the wind aroused me. I opened my eyes, and then I gasped in fright. <gasps> For this time, the glowing figure was standing beside my bed, so near me I could reach out and touch it. Then something terrible happened. I found I, I couldn't breathe. began to make a strange sound. <laughs> then I, I sensed what was happening. The thing was somehow taking the breath from me, getting it into its own body. <laughs> that I screamed. Darling, what is it? What in the world is it? Dawn, look at me. Tell me, what was it? A nightmare? John. John. From then on, events transpired rapidly. You made an appointment for me with Dr. Bland, the eminent psychiatrist. Oh, I know, darling, you were upset because I refused to go to him. But I knew by then that it was no use. The thing was growing bolder all the time. Many nights it stood over me in my room, and without touching me, 
was yet able to take the breath from me and command it to enter its own body. As it did this, night after night, it became stronger and I became weaker. You will recall vividly what occurred two weeks ago tonight. We were invited to the Westings for dinner and we accepted. An hour before we were to leave, I sat at my dressing table putting the last finishing touches to my makeup. It was only dusk outside. Never had the thing appeared, but in the nighttime, I was brushing my hair when I heard the melody of the wind. The figure stood right behind me. And John, I could see what it was. In the mirror, I could see what the thing was. the thing that haunts and torments the beautiful Dean Forrestier, eh? The hermit who knows all the weird and terrible happenings on the earth. The hermit will tell you all before the night is done, yes. <laughs> and now, the hermit. And now, Dr. Forrestier continues to read to a group of newsmen the letter his wife, Dawn Forrestier, left for him before her strange disappearance. Listen to Dawn Forrestier's story of the mystery of the thing. <laughs> this, John, is going to be the difficult part to make you believe. That as the thing stood behind me at the dressing table, I could tell what it was. We didn't go to the Westings for dinner. Instead, you put me to bed. I shouldn't have allowed you to accept, darling. You haven't been up to par for days. I'm going to call Ralph in to see you tomorrow. You don't look well, darling. Don't call anyone in, dear. It'll, it'll do no good. Nonsense, honey. There are very few things that medical science can't cure these days. And believe me, darling... I'm going to have you well again. Your doctor friend came. He gave me medicine to take. Oh, I knew it was no use, no use at all. And yet I would do anything to humor you. For the thing that I now recognized was getting so strong that it was always near me. As I grew weaker, it grew stronger. And I wondered that you couldn't hear it breathing in my room. <sighs> Now it had a power over me, a strong, compelling power. It was the master, I, almost a slave. Night before last, it exerted its will for the first time. It compelled me to rise from my bed. It was so strong now, it could actually make sound. Come with me. As I rose from the bed, its phosphorescent glow seemed to envelop me. We moved toward the door, and it opened without the touch of a hand. We seemed to glide down the stairs, out of doors. The wind that touched my face was like the refrain I'd heard over and over again. We moved along the street. I am the thing. With great speed, we covered the streets and were soon on the outskirts of the city. <gasps> I could see now the place which was our destination. Then I mastered all the willpower left to me, for I understood clearly all the dark things I'd not known before. <gasps> but, but, John, there was you. I couldn't go to this place where the thing was taking me. I couldn't enter there without somehow leaving word for you. I... I struggled. I, I fought with my adversary. <laughs> I was gaming. I broke away. Somehow I got breath and strength enough to return home into my bed. Now comes the end of my story. 
and my farewell to you. Here, gentlemen, I, I will omit a page. It is personal. But what happened to Dawn? Where is she? Since this morning, when the sex in that green cedar burial ground found my wife's clothing, permission has been granted by the state for me to check up on the material found in this letter. I've almost finished reading to you. I'm refraining from reading the last pages until we have made a visit to the cemetery. If you men of the press will get in your cars and follow me, you may be able to complete and verify the information given to me by Don Forestier. Hello, Dr. Forestier. The men have nearly completed digging. Thank you, Sexton. What goes on, Dr. Forestier? As you can see, these men are engaged in opening up a grave. Oh, I want to call, Dr. Can you come to the casket, Doctor? Very well, Sexton. If you'll please open the box. Yes, sir. Can you lift the casket out, boys? Right. <laughs> now, gentlemen, after the box is opened, I will read the remainder of my wife's letter. Open it, please, Sexton. Oh, great heaven. Yeah. Dr. Forrest, dear. Great Scott. Why have you opened this grave? Sexton, will you reach in and procure the diamond ring that lies in the coffin? Yes. Here it is, sir. This is my wife's ring, gentlemen. How did it get in this coffin? Here are the last pages of my wife's letter to me. Now comes the end of my story. And my farewell to you. John, I knew from the moment I saw the thing in the mirror of my dressing table. I knew from then on who and what it was. The first night I was strong enough to break away from it as it drew me to the gates of Green Cedar Cemetery. And I've spent my last day writing this letter to you. For tonight, the thing will appear again. And this time, I must follow it. I must follow it to the grave, John. Into the grave. I know how it will be. The thing, the protoplasm that has appeared before me so many nights and has grown in features and strength will absorb me until I'm no longer a living person. And I must follow it. First, I will hear the music of the wind. Then the thing will appear. And I will be dissolved into it. John, my darling... In case you don't believe my story, open the grave near which you will find my discarded clothing. For I'm wearing the ring you gave me, my love. I'm wearing it as I return to the grave. For you see, John, the thing that I saw in the mirror, that which has gained power over me, is I, John. It is my own ghost. Come to claim me to return to the grave from which I broke away. Ain't it awful, Clara? Could anyone believe such a terrible thing could happen on this earth? Hmm. It's almost too horrible to talk about. Yeah. There, when they opened that grave, lay a decayed skeleton. Oh. Wearing the same patent gown that Dawn Forestier was wearing when she was found wandering in the park by Dr. Forestier. And there was Dawn's ring inside the casket. Yeah. It says here in the Gazette that the inscription on the tombstone over that grave read, Lila Manton. And Lila Manton was a famous actress 85 years ago. She died one night very suddenly, just as she was to appear on the stage. Her cue to appear on stage was an organ playing. The music was written by the man Lila Manton was going to marry that night after the theater play was over. And the name of the man was David Forrestier. He was a relative of Dr. John Forrestier. But she died that night. The marriage never took place. What do you think it means, Clara? Does it mean that Lila Manton returned from the spirit world to live out her life that was ended so suddenly? Sure, I think so. But her ghost body made her come back to the grave. Well, that's how I got it figured out. Forrestier 
was haunted by her own ghost body until it finally absorbed a new vision and shape and made her return to her grave. Yeah, turn on your light. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> All characters, places, and occurrences mentioned in the Hermit's Cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Today's story took place here in New York when we last week. K.O. Brown, lightweight boxing champion, was defending his title against a virtually unknown contender named Lefty Ross. The inspector and I were lucky enough to get ringside seats. No doubt who that round went to, eh, Bart? Not a question, Inspector. Young Lefty Ross doesn't seem to be doing so well, does he? Well, I said right along the kid wasn't ready to meet K.L. Brown. Yeah, you're right. That fat head manager of his... What's his name? Uh, uh, Niall Stanson, yeah. Uh, knows uh, as much about boxing as I do about flagpole sitting. <laughs> Was flagpole sitting the chief sport when you were a boy, Inspector? Oh. Look, Inspector, there comes Samson now. Yeah. I suppose he's going to give young Ross some fatherly advice. Probably. You know, if I had Samson's re reputation, I'd crawl into a hole and I'd, I'd just pull it in after me. You don't think much of Samson, eh, Inspector? I'll say I do. Hey, hey, what's going on over there in K.O.'s corner? It looks as though a private fight of its own has started among the spectators. Uh-oh, here comes a policeman. They'll have it settled in no time. Sometime, I'd like to go to a prize fight and see all the fighting done in the ring. <laughs> Uh, here we go, Inspector. Round two. Yep. Hey, you want to make a little side bet on who takes it? Right. Ten even says Lefty Ross takes it. Are you kidding? That's a sucker bet. Ten even, Inspector. Take it or leave it. Okay. It's a deal. Sucker. That's all right. You see. Hey, what's the matter with K.O.? He's laying down on the job. You've got that twisted, Inspector. Young Ross is waking up on his feet. Look at that. Right? Hey, you bum, get in there and fight. You tell him, Inspector, he needs all the support he can get. My golly. Samson must have given the kid a shot in the arm or something. Either that or Kale was up late last night. Don't get that boy, Slay. Come on, Lefty. My money's on you. What a sight. Hey, those driving. This is something I never expected to see. You and two-thirds of the crowd, Inspector. Look, Kao's down. He's down. He's out. Like a light. Get back to your corner, Lefty. Let the referee come. He's counting. He's counting. Don't worry about your dog. Stop kidding me. minute. There goes Lefty back to his dressing room. Hey, they're certainly putting him out of the ring in a hurry. Well, there isn't going to be any hurry about K.O. leaving. No. He hasn't moved since Lefty hung that right hook on his jaw. Come on, Buck. Let's get out of here. I still can't Wait believe... a minute, Inspector. Oh, all right, all right. Here's your dough. Never mind the dough. Look up there. Ah, uh, where? Oh, so you want me to look at my boy, eh? You got to rub it in, Inspector, eh? Inspector, huh? was more than knocked unconscious. Come on, man. Good gosh, you're right. Follow me, Bart. Hey, make way there, will you? Pardon me, Bart. Inside, you, you guys. Me, 
Yeah. Here we are, Brian. Climb up out of the rope. Right. That's Doc Stanley bending over Kale now. Yeah. If by the expression on his face, I'd say things weren't so good. Hello. How's the story, Doc? Hello, Mr. Drake. Now, this is bad. K.O.'s jaw is broken. He's dead. <laughs> If you think you're going to smell a murder out of this one, you're crazy. The fact that Kale's jaw was broken is enough. The fact that Kale's jaw was broken is the reason why I'm suspicious, Inspector. I don't get it. Look, if the kid could... This is Kale's jaw, then. Let's go in. Hmm. What? I'll take care of that. Open up. Come on, come on, open the door. They don't seem to hear you, Inspector. Oh, well, they better hear me. Hey, open his door in the name of the law. Who is that? Well, how do you like that? Who is it they want to know? The police! Open this door and... It's like bad time. Who oh, the devil... There's he... left here in the rubbing table, Inspector. Let's go over to Yeah. There's Samson with him. One side, Bob. Come on, gentlemen. What's on your mind? Plenty. What's the matter with the kid? Well, what do you think? A couple of rounds of being slugged by a pug like K.O., Onto a kid like Lefty here, no good. You mean that Lefty's up? He was out on his feet when we took him from the ring. By the look of those red welts on his body, he took more of a beating than I thought. Oh. Hey, take it easy, kid. Take it oh. easy. You'll be oh. all right. Is You'll that the right. reason you uh, hurried him out of the ring, Samson? Sure. Don't do no good to let them things get wrong. Oh, oh I figured right, eh? The kid wasn't ready to meet K.O. But you shoved him in just the same. He got in a lucky punch and... Take it easy, Flatfoot. You stick to your snoop and I'll stick to my prize fight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what the devil reason you've got busting in here anyway? Plenty. Now, listen. Inspector, please. Samson, would you mind stepping over here in the corner a minute? Bring along those gloves, Inspector. Yeah. All right, Samson, let's go. Say, what kind of a gag is this? Look, i got to tend to the kid. It'll be just as well if the kid doesn't hear what we have to say for the moment. Okay, okay. What's on your mind? Doc Stanley just finished examining Kale. He's dead. Dead? What do you mean he's dead? Hey, stop breathing. What do you think we mean? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's it got to do with me? What do you need with me for? K.O. died as a result of a beating he took from your boy, Samson. His jaw was broken. What do you mean beating he took from my boy? That's a laugh. <laughs> it was K.O.'s fight right from the first gong until Lefty got in that lucky punch. Yes, yes, it was. That's what made us think that something might be wrong. Inspector, have you examined those gloves? Yeah. They're okay. Nothing wrong there. Say, look, what is this? What are you examining the gloves for? If you think I had anything to do with this, you're crazy. Lefty couldn't hit anyone hard enough to kill him. Anybody know that? That's just the point, Samson. Lefty couldn't hit K.O. hard enough to kill him. And he couldn't hit hard enough to break K.O.'s jaw. That's why I think that K.O. was murdered. <laughs> You didn't win. Yes, I won. I'm the new lightweight champion. Oh, darling. Darling, now we can have... Lefty, what's wrong? But you haven't heard? Haven't I heard what, honey? I've just been sitting here waiting. K.O.'s dead. Dead? Darling, what are you saying? He's dead. He died because... Well, because I hit him too hard. <laughs> honey, you're joking. How could he die because you hit him too hard? That's ridiculous. They think I had my gloves padded. They think I murdered him. They let me go because they couldn't turn up any evidence, but I can't leave town. The idea. Well, the very idea of thinking that you... They're coming up here to ask me questions. They... They think I did it. They think I'm a murderer. They... Oh, darling, don't. Of course you didn't do it. Of course you're not a murderer. I must be. They said Kale died from blows he received in the ring. They examined my gloves. They thought the gloves had been padded. Look, darling, be reasonable. You couldn't have hit him that hard. And even if you did, it wouldn't be your fault. Lefty, your gloves weren't padded. I don't know. I, I don't remember. 
It's all confused in my mind. Maybe they were paid. Oh, oh there they are now. I, I've got to get out of here. You're doing nothing of the sort. You stay right where you are. This is the silliest thing I ever heard of. Yes? Sorry to intrude, Mrs. Ross. You are Mrs. Ross, aren't you? Yes, I'm Mrs. Ross. If you're the police, Lefty has already told me. I'm Barton Drake. Me. This is Inspector Noah Denton. Hi. Hello, Lefty. Hello, Mr. Drake. Now, see here, Mr. Drake. It's utterly ridiculous to think that Lefty could yes, have... Yes, yes, I know. We don't believe Lefty's capable of delivering a blow hard enough to kill any man any more than you do. But still, you've accused him of murder. Not yet we haven't, lady. It's like this. If K.O. died as a result of the blows he received, the gloves had to be padded. Padded? Yeah. Are you accusing Lefty of padding his gloves? What does Lefty have to say about it? Well, I don't know, Mr. Drake. I, I wouldn't pad them myself, but suppose someone else did. Someone else? That's a hot one. Look, son, don't stand there and tell us you wouldn't know whether or not you were wearing gloves with a hunk of lead in one of them. Well, I, I suppose I'd know. Sure you'd know, and the referee would know when he looked the gloves over. That's not... just the point. The referee would know. Lefty, tell us exactly what happened from the time you left your dressing room until you returned there after the fight. Well, I don't know exactly what... That is, I'm not sure. Everything's so confused. You don't know. <laughs> now, look, son. You don't expect us to believe that. And why not? Lefty was excited. It was his first big fight. Naturally, he's confused about what happened. You remember the fight, don't you, Lefty? Yes, I remember that. I remember taking a beating in the first round. I remember the roar of the crowd and Samson yelling at me, calling me a coward, telling me to get in there and fight. Then the gong rang, and I remember thinking it would have to be now or never. So you got in there and slugged, eh? Yeah, that's right. Lefty, or I mean K.O., must have worked me over pretty badly. I, I guess I was out on my feet when they took me from the ring. I got in one lucky punch, and, and that was all. Well, I got to admit it was a beautiful sock. Now, me... I don't think you were so confused, Bob. I'm sorry, Inspector. I think he was. Huh? But look, Bob, if he can remember getting in there and Inspector, slugging... Inspector, I'm going to change my opinion about K.O. Brown being murdered. I think his death was accidental. Accidental? Yes. Tell me, Lefty, this was to be your last fight, wasn't it? Well, yes, Mr. Drake. Well, that is, if I lost, it was. Mm -hmm. And you had every intention of losing. I mean, by that, you knew you weren't ready to meet K.O. And you didn't think you had a chance of licking him. That's right. Samson didn't think so either, but he offered me big money to take K.O. on. Look, Lefty and I want to buy a farm. Neither of us have any relatives, except Lefty's brother Mike, who isn't much good. Fighting was the only way Lefty knew of earning enough money before we got too old. You can't blame him. I'm not blaming him, Mrs. Ross. One more question, Lefty. Suppose K.O. hadn't died. Suppose you just knocked him out there by making yourself champion. Would you have stuck with Samson? Well, if I got to be champ, I don't suppose I could have let Samson down until after I had at least one more fight. Exactly. Inspector, I think we'd better get down to Niall Samson's gymnasium. We're going to work a little bluff on Mr. Samson that should definitely pay off. <laughs> Right, still snooping around, Samson. Well, are these two hairy gentlemen your bodyguards? That's it, Drake. My bodyguards. They get paid to see that no harm comes to me. You understand? Yes, perfectly. Drake, you're smart. All right, boys, relax. Now, uh, what's on your mind, Drake? A little matter of murder, Samson. That's rather a new line for you, isn't it? Let's say it's out of my line entirely, chum. I see. Meaning, of course, that you didn't murder K.O. Brown. I didn't lay a hand on him. And I can prove it. Can you prove that you didn't pad one of the gloves worn by Lefty Ross with a pair of brass knuckles or worse? Ah, that's a laugh. <laughs> I suppose next you're going to tell me I had the referee in my pay. I think you would if you could, Samson. Failing on that, you resorted to the next best thing. You padded the glove yourself. You did it between round one and two. Sure, just walked up, stuck a hunk of iron in a glove with everyone looking on it. No yeah? one was looking at you, Samson, because everyone's attention was attracted to the fight among the spectators that started near K.O.'s corner. You're reaching for something that ain't there, Drake. Can I help it if a couple of drunks get to slapping each other around? You helped this one. You paid the drunks to do it. Inspector Danton just took them down to headquarters where I feel reasonably sure he'll persuade them to confess. What? Why, you two? Well, now that we've cleared up that point, perhaps you'd like to confess to petting Lefty's glove. Look, Drake, you're too smart for your pants. 
Why don't you go have a talk with Lefty? Uh Uh-huh. I just came from there. And I suppose he told you that between round one and two, I come up and stashed a slug in his glove. No, I'm sorry to say he didn't. Which blows your theory wide open, don't it? Listen, that kid's on the level. He wouldn't let me pull a fast one like that even if I wanted to. I'm quite aware of that, Samson. That's the reason I'm going to hunt through your desk for a bottle of scopolamine tablets. Are you saying I drugged a kid? That's what I'm saying, Samson. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. I drugged a kid so he wouldn't know I was loading his glove. But he was still in good enough condition to knock out Kayo. You sound triumphant, Samson. Yeah, triumphant. Yeah, that's a, that's a good word. I think you're a little bit wacky if you expect anybody to believe that crackpot story. Now get out of here. I got things to do. I'm afraid you'll have to postpone the things you have to do, Samson. Keep away from that desk, Drake. Afraid of what I might find, Samson? I'll show you how afraid I am. Boys, lock the door. I wouldn't do it, boys. Inspector Danton will be back here any minute, and he won't be alone. So what if he is? I'm telling you to get out of this office or else. Sorry, Samson. You've been training fighters for years. You ought to understand this. Why, why you lousy? Get him, boys. Okay, if that's the way you want it, come on. Oh, you will, will you? Open it. Open the door. Get him, Take care of Drake. Come on, boys. Let's get out the back door. What that don't know won't hurt him. Hey, you get back out of Drake. Open up or I'm shooting this lock to blaze. <clears throat> wait, wait, wait a minute, Inspector. I'll let you in. Something. Judas Bob, look at your face. They did a job on you, eh? Yes, yes, it feels that way, Inspector. Oh, what did you let them lock the door for? I uh, was busy at the moment. Well, anyway, the bluff worked. Samson thought sure as heck I was working over some of his boys down at headquarters. I'm afraid our bluff missed fire entirely, Inspector. What do you mean? I heard every word Samson said. The trouble is you didn't see what I saw. You see something special? Very special, Inspector. Just as Samson and his boys reached the rear door, it opened and a man came in. Samson yelled at him to get back out of sight. Well, who was it? Lefty Ross. <laughs> Mugs had done something to your thinking apparatus. That couldn't have been Lefty Ross you saw. Well, possibly you're right about Lefty, Inspector, but there's nothing wrong with my thinking apparatus. Who are you calling? Every minute we waste here gives Samson more time to get away, you Samson know. Samson won't go far, Inspector. As soon as he realizes that running away will amount to confession, he'll be back. Hello? Hello, Lefty. This is Drake. Oh, yes, Mr. Drake. Lefty, have you been away from your apartment since Inspector Denton and I were there? Good. Now, listen carefully. Lefty. I wish I had your faith that that mug Samson would stick around when he knows. That's right, Lefty. Now, if you'll follow those instructions, I think you and Donna will be able to buy your farm. Do you think you can handle it, Lefty? Sure, Mr. Drake. We'll do anything you say. What time do you want Donna and me to leave the apartment? Oh, in about uh, 15 minutes. Inspector Danton and I will have everything under control by then. Okay, Mr. Drake. We'll be there. You can count on us. Fine. Goodbye, Lefty. See you later. Well, Inspector, do you think my plan will work? It'll work as far as we're concerned, but suppose Samson doesn't play ball. He will, Inspector, I'm sure of it. We're giving him an opportunity to destroy evidence that will prove him guilty of murder, and I doubt if he'll fail to bite. Come on. Where are we going? We're going out the front door of the gymnasium and walk down the street as though we were leaving the place for good. You figure that Samson's watching outside for us to do just that, eh? That's exactly what he's doing. As soon as he's sure we're gone, he'll return to his office. After all, he's, he feels reasonably sure that we haven't got a thing on him. Now, if he can destroy certain evidence that is probably hidden around this gym somewhere, he's going to feel pretty smug. Okay, I only hope those kids don't get themselves into a jam. They won't, Inspector. We're going to be on hand to see that they don't. Come along. Lefty, what if Mr. Drake's plan doesn't work? Oh, it'll work, Donna. Drake knows what he's doing. The only chance I had of escaping a murder charge. Oh, uh, this is Samson's office here. Aren't you going to knock? No, let's surprise him. Hey, what the? Oh, I killed kids. And a little woman, too. Well, come right in. Come in. Hello, Niles. I dropped by to tell you I was quitting the ring. Oh, you did? Now, just a minute, kid. You ain't walking out on me just when I made you champ, are you? Yes, I am. That fight wasn't on the level, and you know it. You better back that statement up with a few facts, kid. I don't like it. I didn't think you would, Niles, so I got the facts. All the facts I need. Yeah? 
Such as what? Well, I talked to some people who saw the fight. They said I took quite a beating in the first round. They said it? <laughs> don't you know yourself whether you did or not? No, I don't. That's what I wanted to ask you about, Miles. Everyone I talked to said K.O. Lamb basted me all over the place. They said that mostly he went after my face and head. Is that a fact? Yeah. And when I heard that, I began to wonder why I didn't have any marks or bruises on my face at all. Oh, so that's it, huh? Well, now, ain't that a shame? Kid, it's just a lucky thing my boys are here. They can just take care of your predicament without no trouble at all. Uh, boys, eh... Uh... The kid here figures he ought to have some marks on his face and head to show he's been in a fight. Lefty, look out. They're going to beat you up. Now, now, Mrs. Ross, don't you worry. My boys will give Lefty what he wants, and then we'll all sit down and have a nice little talk about whether or not the kid's going to walk out on Niall Simpson. No, no, leave him alone. Give it to him, boys. He asked for it. Keep away from you, Mr. Get out. Back, right, you punks. Get away from him. Sit still, Samson. Bart, go over there and frisk him, will you? Glad to, Inspector. Hey, what is this? What's the idea? In case you're really wondering, Samson, we'll let Lefty's brother Mike give you the details. But why, you... You can't prove a thing by him. Not a thing. What's my brother Mike got to do with this, Mr. Drake? Quite a lot, son. It was Mike who fought K.O. Brown yesterday, not you. But that's impossible. No, no, that's not as impossible as you might think, Mrs. Ross. You see, before the fight, Lefty was given a scopolamine tablet. Scopolamine? What's that? It's a new drug, Lefty. It puts the patient in a semi-conscious state. Some psychiatrists use it as a, sub a substitute for hypnotism. Well, I can't believe I wasn't actually in that ring. You don't remember the fight? <laughs> you said to yourself. Well, it's all confusing. I'll tell you why you can't remember it, Lefty. Samson had a loudspeaker rigged up in your dressing room. You heard the fight, and Samson kept yelling at you to get in there and slug. And someone else kept whacking you with a wet towel, which accounted for the wealth on your body. It was your brother who was actually in the ring. He looked enough like you so that no one noticed the difference. And between rounds one and two, Samson came up and padded one of Mike's gloves while everyone's attention was attracted to the fight near K.O.'s corner. Mike had been training for weeks. It wasn't much good, but he had enough stuff to last two rounds, which was all Samson wanted. Yeah, but why? Why did Samson go to all that trouble? The answer to that is obvious, Mrs. Roth. Lefty was going to quit the ring, but Samson knew if he won the championship, he'd feel morally obligated to stick for at least one more bout. And maybe Samson could work the same gag again. Okay, boys, you got me. That's just the way it happened. I should have figured I couldn't get away with it. Huh? What? Did you hear what I heard? The um, guy actually admits it. I uh, know when I'm licked, Stanton. I got that box of scop all on me bills in this drawer in case. Watch him, Inspector. There's a gun in that drawer. You bet there is. Take care of Drake, boys. Boys, better take care of themselves, you jerks. Get up for a Here, Inspector, the Rosses live in that apartment house. I know it. I've been here before. <laughs> That's right. I don't know how Lefty and I can ever thank you two for all you've done don't for try, me. Mrs. Ross. It's the sort of thing that the Inspector and I enjoy. Hey, Inspector? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> we had a heck of a time. Say, uh, uh, look, Bart, uh, I've been figuring... Just a minute, Inspector. Huh? Were you going to say something, Lefty? Well, yes, I was. Well, what if no one had noticed, Mr. Drake? Well, I mean, Samson never let me have much publicity. You suppose he, he was kept you undercover on purpose? Yes, I do. The fewer times your picture appeared, the less likelihood of anyone recognizing Mike when he stepped into the ring. Ah, I guess you're right. Mike and I look almost exactly alike. Did you know it wasn't me in the ring, Mr. Drake? No, as a matter of fact, I didn't. Oh, then how did you guess? What uh, gave you the idea that something was wrong? It was your name, Lefty. My name? Of course. You got your name for being left-handed, didn't you? Yes, I did, but... K.O. Brown was knocked out by two rights to the heart and a right hook to the jaw. That's it. That's what I was trying to figure out. But hand me over ten bucks. Ten bucks, Inspector? Sure, you bet me ten even on that second round. I don't understand, Inspector. I bet you ten even that Lefty would take the second round, remember? Well, sure I remember. But Lefty didn't take it. It was his brother Mike who took it. You proved it yourself. Now, give me my ten uh, bucks. Uh, 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 you will... All right, you got me, Inspector. <laughs> I stuck my chin out on that one. Here you are. Thanks. Well, I happen to think of that. Uh, by the way, Bart, uh, there's a fight at the gardens next week. So? Now, look, I'll bet you 15 uh, bucks no, on you this. don't, huh? Inspector. Not a chance. From now on, I'm betting on only one thing, huh? and that is... 
mystery of my hobby. The amazing story of David Lang of Gallatin, Tennessee, was first publicized by none other than the famous American writer Ambrose Bierce. Since Bierce was a skeptic of the First Order, those tales of the supernatural which he saw fit to vouch for need little else to give them authenticity. Of these, however, none is better documented and none more baffling than the curious case of the man who vanished. The thing happened in a field. It was a flat, ordinary field stretching out beyond the David Lang farmhouse near Gallatin, Tennessee. On that late afternoon in September of 1880, Lang himself and his wife sat on the back porch. There's a buggy coming yonder, Dave. Reckon it's that there fellow from Gallatin, named Corey. He said he might come out and talk business this afternoon. I'd better get a move on. Uh, where are you going, Dave? Fetch in the horses. I'll be back in a minute. David Lang started across the field at a dog trot, and he had almost reached the middle of it when his wife suddenly leaped to her feet and... Dave! Dave, where are you? Where'd you go? Mrs. Lang raced across the field to the point where she had last seen her husband. And as she ran, she saw that the horse and buggy on the road had stopped and that another figure was rapidly approaching her. They met in midfield and looked at each other in blank bewilderment. He, he disappeared. But he couldn't have. He must have fell down a hole of some kind. But there ain't any hole. Three nights after Lang's disappearance, his widow wandered alone and inconsolable near the spot where she had suffered her great loss. Suddenly, she heard the voice of a man in distress. Help! Help me, somebody! Help! Dave, where are you? Help me, I somebody! I can hear your voice, Help! but I can't see you. Help! Tell me where to find you, Dave! There were other members of the family. There were neighbors who testified that it was unquestionably the voice of David Lang. For two weeks, it continued to call out periodically, growing fainter each time. And then, at last, it was silence. The winter passed, and spring came, and Mr. Corey, the gentleman from Gallatin, had come out once again to discuss with Mrs. Lang the business which had been so tragically interrupted the previous September. As they talked, they strolled slowly across the field. And then, at the same instant, both of them stopped short and stared open-mouthed at the ground beneath them. It's the same spot. The place where, where we last saw David. Him, look at it now. Must be 15 feet across. A circle of dead grass. Dr. Hearn, the Viennese scientist suggested that he had stepped into a void spot in the universal ether and had been annihilated. And a prominent physicist hazarded the opinion that some sort of magnetic field had speeded up the atomic vibrations of his body, thus projecting him into a new vibratory dimension. But these are mere guesses. The guesses which science must resort to when faced by facts that defy analysis. Facts incredible, but true. <laughs> Welcome you again into the Inner Sanctum. 
Come on. No, no, please don't stand on ceremony. We're all informal here. No ties, no collars. In some cases, no hair. <laughs> Now, that doesn't mean we're complete boors, though. We study our Emily ghosts faithfully. You wouldn't catch one of us eating his teeth with a knife. Oh, no. We've been caught with knives before. Sewing, you might say, our wild throats. <laughs> Beginning right now, things are going to happen. So sit up, draw a deep breath, and lend us an ear. We've got to get our teeth into something. <laughs> Listen now to the voice of Donald Buker as Danny Williams, as he tells the weird story of the dead walk at night. <laughs> Again. Daddy. My uncle calling to me. Just as he used to when I was a boy. My blind uncle tapping his cane and calling. Daddy, where are you? I said, I wish I could join him. I tried to a thousand times, but they've always prevented me. Goes on incessantly. For the shots, even when I sleep, I hear every minute, every second. Sometimes not. I can thunder. Can't you stop it? Can't you give me one minute, please? Why don't you stop it, you blind old fool? Leave me alone. Haven't you got enough? Leave me alone. Tap that way with his cane. On the night I decided to kill him. We were in his room in the big house where we lived together. I had been living with him since I was 14 years old. For 10 years i had been his companion. His nurse, his servant, his slave. On the night I was going to kill him, I slipped a length of strong cord into my dinner jacket. He was... Totally blind. Had been for 30 years. Yet, strangely enough, he could see. He could see with his uncanny, highly developed sense of hearing. And with that cane of his, that cane was everlastingly tapping. The wind's blowing up tonight. It'll be getting cold soon. Yes. And then... Oh, sudden gone. This is a night off. You going out again tonight? Yes. With Martha? Yes, with Martha. Hmm. Let me some brandy. Yes, Martha. I poured out the drink. In my pocket, I felt the cord, and as I handed the drink to him, I took it out and walked behind him. Now... This was the time. Slip the cord around his neck. Twist it. It would be over soon. He sat there, holding the glass in one hand. I raised the cord over his head. All I had to do was drop it over his neck. Why are you standing behind me? What? How did you know? I heard you walk there. Why, Danny? I just wanted to look out of the window. One quick move, it would be over. But I didn't want to kill him, so I... I'd make a clean breast of it and give him a chance. Well, then, how long are you going to stand there? Morgan, there's something I want to speak to you about. Well, what is it, my boy? I want to marry Martha. I... Uh, I thought that was on your mind. But I need $10,000, Morgan. Will you give it to me? What? What are you laughing at? You. I was just waiting to see how much you'd ask for. 
You lied your way in pretty deeply this time, didn't you, Danny? What are you talking about? I saw what was coming. I, uh, while you were in town, we had a very interesting little talk. Did you? Mm-hmm. She told me that her father's worried about her marrying a fortune hunter. Seems he's a very wealthy man. Yes, that's right. And it seems that he won't give Martha any money when she marries unless her husband is a man of some means himself. It also seems that you lied to her. You told her you're wealthy. Why? Did you tell her the truth? No. You always were an incorrigible liar. Well, Morgan, she got the impression that I had some money because I lived in this house. And now you have to live up to that impression so you can marry her. But you'll give me the money, won't you? Why'd you lie to her? Well, I did it without thinking. I, I wanted to tell her the truth, but I couldn't. I was afraid that if she found out that I'd lied, she'd hate me. Morgan, are you going to give me the money? Danny, I'm very fond of you. I took you in to live with me when you were a poor, penniless goddess knight. I educated and taught you to live like a gentleman. I even named you sole beneficiary of my estate. But that's why I'm asking you for the money now. If you're going to leave me all of it, why don't you give me a little of it now? Because I don't want you to marry Martha. Why not? I don't think she's the girl for you. You stupid, blind old fool. Man. Martha's the finest girl I ever met. I, I won't have you talking about her like this. You won't have a penny of my money to marry her. You do just because you want me to stay with you. Now, what are you talking about? From the very first day I came here, it's been Danny do this, Danny do that. Danny, read to me. Danny, pour me some brandy. You've made me a servant as a slave. How can you talk this way after all I've done for you? Done for me? Did you ever teach me to work? Did you ever teach me to do anything except live in luxury when I didn't have a penny to my name? You made me someone who's of no earthly good to anything or anyone except you. Well, what are you going to do about it? Leave? No. I'm not going to leave, Morgan. You are. What do you mean? I'm going to kill you. Don't be ridiculous, my boy. You'd probably make a bungling mess of it. I don't think so. You see, I planned it very carefully. Uh, Danny, if you think you can frighten me into giving you that money, you're quite mistaken. I don't intend to frighten you. I intend to murder you. You... You're not serious. Yes, I am, Morgan. Danny, you... You got up, I heard you. Yes. Now, don't lose your head. Perhaps we can come to some agreements. Too late for that. Don't think you can stall me and then turn me over to the police. Danny, where are you? You'll know in a minute, Morgan. When you feel something on your neck. Oh! Oh! No. Let go of me. It'll be over in a minute. Let go of me, you idiot. Let go. Not now, Morgan. All right, all right, Danny. I'll admit it. I wanted you to stay with me. I'm... I'm blind, old, alone, but, but I'll let you go. I'll give you the money you want, and only don't kill me. It's too late now. I know oh. you, and I don't trust your promises. I'll give you anything you want. You'll hear anything now, please, Dad. No, Morgan. Oh, if I could only see. If I could only see. Oh. Oh. I'm going to be merciful, Morgan. It'll only take a few seconds, and this sword will crush the life out of you. Morgan? Morgan? He's dead. I heard the front door open and close. I had told Martha to come at nine o'clock. I ran out of the room and looked down the long stairway. Hello, darling. Martha. Shall I come up? No, no. Wait there. I'll come right down. All right. I rushed back into the room. My uncle was lying on the floor. The rope twisted about his neck. His face streaked with purple. I picked up the cane and began tapping on the floor. Then I placed the cane near to him. I went back to the door again and called. Good night, Morgan. Mr. 
your uncle. Oh, he's fine. I heard him tapping around up there. Yes, he likes to make a lot of noise with that cane of his. I think he gets a kick out of it. Do you think it's safe to leave him alone here? Safe? Well, of course. Uh, look, shall we go dancing somewhere? Mm-hmm. That's a swell idea. <laughs> Uncle Morgan will stay dead. Oh, you do? Well, that shows how much you know. On this program, the dead never stay that way. So get ready for the worst, because in the next few minutes, you're going to find corpses that walk in the dead of the night. Oh, yes. They do, all right. They do. Don't you worry. <laughs> Let's listen now to Donald Duke as Danny as he finishes his story. It's easy to lie to the police. When Martha told them that she heard my uncle tapping in his room, I was cleared of all suspicion. I suggested that the murder was committed by some thief who broke into the house to rob it after we had left. Police agreed. I received the inheritance. And Martha and I planned to go to California to be married. I had lied my way out and fooled everyone. Everyone. Except myself. I knew what I'd done. I couldn't forget it. I became nervous and morose. And then came that last night before Martha and I were to go away. I was alone in the house, preparing to close it. Martha. Well, it's so late I didn't expect you. I know, darling, but I was afraid to leave you alone in this huge old house. I decided to come over. Well, that's very sweet of you, darling, but there's nothing to worry about. You can't fool me. I've noticed how you were behaving these last few days. Ever since your poor uncle was killed, you haven't been quite yourself. Well, I suppose I have been a little upset. I'm glad you came, darling. Look, I can put you in the guest room next to my uncle's old room. That's the only one beside my own that hasn't been dismantled yet. Come on. I'll show you the way. All right. When we get to California and we're married, you'll forget all this. I hope so. What was that? I didn't hear anything. I... I thought I heard a noise. I was right. This old house is affecting you. Maybe. Maybe. You know, Martha, last night I... I thought I heard him tapping with his cane. Did you? Well, it was just my imagination, I guess. I wonder. You know, darling, I had a rather strange dream about him. You did? I... I dreamed he came to me and told me he wasn't dead. Well, that's a crazy idea. Isn't it? But just suppose he wasn't dead. Well, that's impossible. I saw him dead with a rope around his neck. Did you? That's funny. I went with you to the morgue and I didn't see the rope. The police had removed it. Oh, yes. Yes, of course they had. That I... Well, well, I saw those welts. It didn't take much imagination to see the rope. Oh, my poor Danny. I'm afraid this has affected you more than you realize. Now, here's your room, Martha. Danny, you've been kind of cold and, and distant lately. You do love me, don't you, darling? Of course, Martha. There. Good night, Dad. Good night. I was awakened that night from a tortured sleep by a familiar sound. The sound of my uncle's pain tapping on the floor above me. First I thought I was dreaming, but then I heard it again. It seemed to be coming closer to be taking a familiar course. Yes. I had heard it a thousand times when he was alive. That same nervous, rhythmic tapping. It was coming downstairs. Tap, tap, tap. Downstairs. Cautiously. Carefully. It was on a landing now. Would it go down further or would it turn if it had been so often to my room? Came closer. Closer. It was coming to my room. There could be no doubt about that. It couldn't be alive, and yet. 
It was knocking at the door. It took every bit of courage I had, but I went to the door and opened it. There on the floor outside my door was my uncle's cane. A throb of cold, icy terror shook me. I ran back into the room and half insane with panic, I shouted, Martha! 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 Danny, what's the matter? Martha, Martha, darling. I, I, I must be going out of my mind. I saw... What did you see? That cane. That cane that you have in your hand. Put it down. I found it outside your door. I thought you'd misplaced it. Oh, now that's my uncle's cane. That's the one he always used. But Danny, there's no need to be so frightened of it. Why, you think it was going to hurt you the way you asked. Martha! Here, you hold it. No. Honey, you're terrified. What's wrong? What's happened? Martha, Martha, don't make me tell you. Don't. But what are you afraid of? That cane. Put it down. Pull it away. The cane? Throw it away. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, Martha, why do you keep pointing it at me? Why? Danny, you've got to tell me what's troubling you. I won't put it down until you tell me why you're afraid. Martha, for heaven's sake. You can trust me, Danny. I love you. Tell me what it is. Martha. What is it? No matter what it is, I'll always love you. Don't be afraid to tell me. I killed him. Your uncle? Yes. Why? For the inheritance. I I didn't want you to know that I didn't have a cent. I asked him for the money, begged him for it. He sat there in his chair telling me I couldn't have a cent. He wanted to keep me here with him. I wanted to marry you. That's why I murdered him, Martha, because I love you. Do you understand? Yes. Oh, Martha. Martha, I knew you would. You'll stand by me, won't you? Why are you smiling that way? How much money did you inherit? Two hundred thousand dollars in this house. You'll transfer that money to me in the morning. When the house is sold, you'll turn over that money to me, too. If you don't, I'll tell the police what you just told me. Martha, I don't understand. I thought I was pretty clear. Oh, I... I, I see now. You, you you think I'm too upset to manage the estate and you want to take care of it for me until we're married? There isn't going to be any marriage. No marriage? No. Now that I can get the money without marrying you, there's no reason for me to tie myself down. Why should you want the money? Your father... He's been dead for 17 years. Martha, you told... You were lying to me. Yes, dear. But you were lying to me, so it comes out even... You stopped cowering with this cane. There's nothing queer about it. I made that tapping noise tonight. I thought it would make you confess, and it did. (laughs) This is a joke. (laughs) It's a monstrous joke. (laughs) I wouldn't think it was so funny if I were in your position. You know, the money isn't quite all. I can use you, Danny. I might need certain things done sometimes. And if you'll remember that I can send you to the electric chair whenever I choose to, you'll do them. I see. The slave merely changes masters. Where are you going? Back to my room. Oh, you're not. Ben, let go of me. I want to show you something, Martha. Something about this cane. You said there was nothing queer about it. Well, there is. Let me show you. You didn't know, did you, that if you press a button in the handle, the outer covering slips off and you have a sword in your hand. A sword? Yes. Look. Yes. See? It's a sharp sword. Forged in Italy during the Renaissance to be used by men with less chance than I about murder. Dan, what are you going to do? I think you know. No, Dan, you can't. Did you think I would give you that money after I murdered a man to get it? I'll let you keep the money. You think I believe you? I know, liar. I won't tell the police. I swear I won't. I'll do anything you say. I'll marry you. You think I'd marry you after I found out that your love was a lie? Do you think I'd let you live when I know you have a secret that can enslave me? No, Dan. Take that sword away. Don't do it. I I love you. Liar. Dan, don't. Please. I I said you are. I'll do anything. Anything you say. Don't. Mother. It was then that I first began hearing in my mind. That happy, happy, happy. That incident happened in the cave. When the police came, I told them everything. They asked only one question. When did you hear this tapping in your mind? After I killed him. Hmm. Well, you'll be all right after a good doctor treats you. Perhaps. Meanwhile, we'll do everything we can to find the person who killed your uncle and your sweetheart. 
I think it's the same man. He's probably some thief who thought he'd try a second time. But I just told you, I'm the person you want. Now, Danny, you don't think I believe that story for a minute, do you? You, you don't believe it? After the way I saw you cry when your uncle died. And you can't make me believe the sweet girl did the things you said. I know something about human nature, my boy. No, Danny, the shock of finding your sweetheart murdered so soon after your uncle's murder was too much for you. This whole confession was a lie. For 20 years now, I've been in this cell at the state asylum waiting to die. I, who told the truth, I wanted to die. For 20 years, I've been hearing that tapping day and night every second. But please. I've been hearing my blind uncle call me as he used to when I was a boy. Dan, Dan, where are you? Why don't you come to me, Dan? All right, friends, you can relax now. No. No, this isn't Danny. This is your home. Our story's over and the pauses are now mopping up. Well, I guess tonight's little story should teach you never to tell a lie. Lying leads to cheating and cheating leads to murder. And murder leads to insanity, all of which are very bad habits to get into indeed. <laughs> Well, friends, it's time once again to close that creaking door. Until next week at the same time, when we'll be back with a little hunk of horror. <laughs> You'll be sure to listen, aren't you? Until next week, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Every door has a key. There's a key to every situation. Behind every unopened door, there is a mystery. And the opening of this door introduces us to another in the series, The Key. Try this one. Done in a second. No deception, ladies and gentlemen. Just a trick. McGill's wonder lock, and it's as simple as any of them. He won't thank you for breaking it. Danny, something tells me McGill is really after you this time. He has been ever since I opened that first mortise lock of his. Really after you? The full vengeance job. I think he'd kill you if he could. Cloda, I would him. In fact, I think we'll have a grand reckoning, the big showdown. Ruining his business isn't going to make him any friendlier. He started it. He's challenged me so often, I'm tired of it. I'll challenge him, and I'll wipe him off for good and all. The big grudge fight, no holds barred, and to the death. Oh, you joke. But will he? 
Danny, you've opened so many locks of his that there comes a time when he's got to remove you. Remove? You're a one-man act. He's a multiple business. You're an income, but he's an empire. He's big and self-made and ruthless. You find it amusing. He hasn't got a sense of humor. Give it up. All right. All right, Cloda, I'll give it up. I'll give it up after this one final death struggle. Escapologist or big tycoon, the little man or the monstrous cartel, roll up, roll up and see the tussle of the century. Can the redoubtable Danny Cash escape from the new McGill Luck, or will this contest end in his humiliation? Will he... Danny, Danny, don't joke about it. For once in my life, I'm scared. And if you're going to do it, don't waste time ranting and raving. Get on practicing. Yes, miss. It's closed. It's open. It's closed. It's open. It's closed. It's open. That's it. It's easier than the clasp on a necklace. <clears throat> One week, and McGill chews dust. McGill, the maker of putty locks. His locks may be putty, but he isn't. Has uh, anything happened, Danny? Happened? No, why should it? Oh, that burglar alarm? Oh, that. That was fixed. Well, you never know. Snoopers and spies and pale white things trying to find out more than they should. Clodagh, I may be lighthearted, but I'm not a fool. Aren't you? Houdini might have found the tank a little difficult, but there's no reason why I should. A bath. I must remember to have the water heated. Houdini nearly died. Danny, did you know I've been followed yesterday and today? The price you pay for being the wife of a celebrity. It wasn't that sort of following. It was a most unpleasant little man who, who glittered. His eyes glittered, and he wore a tie pin as big as a paperweight. Ah, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. The watchdog, the spy, McGill scared. I must make the bet $20,000. 30, 40. What's it matter? Make it 50,000. Danny, please don't. The signal. The pale little glittering man is on his way up. Glitter, glitter, little man. How I wonder who I am. Relax, dear. Take it easy. Leave it all to the luck of the Irish. A trap for the unwary. And who is so unwary as the trapper trapped? I call the tune, and you, my darling Clodagh, string along. First the door ajar. Not open so as to give suspicion, but not quite closed. Finesse in everything. And now, my brother. Dear brother, do come in. My brother Danny. I reckon only a mirror could stand between us. Brother Finnegan, you're so right. But, brother, we must be careful. We must advance with caution. We are beset by spies, glittering spies. Spies like the morning dew after smog has passed by. But, brother, what is all this? We've done a double act for years. Why should anyone find out now? Ah, there is double dealing and treachery afoot. Big men, big men, if you get my meaning, would give a fortune to know that Danny Cash, the amazing, the incredible Danny Cash, does all his amazing feats of escape with the aid of a brother, a double, a twin, an identical spit. They are not safe, brother. Caution. The word is have a care and trust nobody. Fair Cloda, I would kiss that fair mouth, but <laughs> alas, you might not know I'm me and think I was the other. Brother. But have no fear. Our double treachery and treacherously doubling to fool the audience is a secret between us. If so small a thing as a secret could come between us. A secret? What is it? A whispered word. An endearment. A coziness engendered merely by knowing something others do not. Your lips are... Brother. Alas, who can blame me for wishing to taste the bitten apple? Twins are the same in love and need and want. My heart beats the self-same rhythm, the exact music. And Blarney. Touché. A hit. A palpable hit. No more. Finnegan, we are here for business. Ah, enchanting business. Will you stop making love to my wife and listen to me? This is very important. McGill is really after us this time. No holds barred. And if he should find out that we pulled a gag on him and the public by switching, he'd... 
Well, he'd wipe us off the face of the earth. For 20 years, my dear brother Danny, we've gotten away with it. Well, I hope you're getting away with it this time. And I hope you know what you're doing. But of course. Enemy, jealous lover, brother, all in one. Danny's right. And you are too, Clodagh. We must be very careful this time. Caution. Forethought, track covering, and still more caution. Twin and identical brothers fooling the public. Oh, five. And, Finnegan, remember, if McGill should find out, it'd be more than five. It'd be as good as putting our necks in a noose. So, caution, care, shh, shh. I'll see you back safely to your hideout. Follow me. And see you in a week at the theater. Well, so much for that. And look at me, not in awe. Such cleverness comes to me naturally. Pride comes before a fall. How prettily you coin a phrase. And... Ah, our glittering friend has gone. Well, now we relax. And? Wait. Wait, dear Clodagh, for that phone to ring. Ah, patience brings its own rewards. Bet your dollar it's McGill. Hello? One dollar. Don't tell me, let me guess. Why, a voice like a rusty lock could only belong... Cash. Listen to me, Cash. $100,000 on the outcome of a week tonight. My dear fellow, make it two, three, four, if you like. I'll tell you what, let's make it the round half million. You haven't got half a million. I soon will have. Let me see. All right, done. I'll give it to the papers. You've gone too far this time, Danny Cash. And talking of cash, we'll make it cash. Cash on the mail. Cash at the theater. You come to the theater with $500,000 in cash, cash. <laughs> uh, you're cash this time. <laughs> Goodbye. Rush in, sweet McGill. Rush in. Danny, you haven't got half a million. Oh, this apartment, the furniture, my insurance and yours, the car, jewelry. Oh, I think we'll make half a million. You'll make it without me. I've made that jewelry by hard work keeping you from spending it. And you haven't got any insurance. They wouldn't. And as for the car and the apartment, they're mine. You gave them to me. Honey, love or lamb, what we have is ours. Oh, it's no good, Danny. The dawn in the morning, I don't keep that from you. You sleep. The silver of the moon and the music we've shared. Clodagh, darling, this is me, your own husband, the light of your eyes asking you. No. Honey, lamb, I've never asked you for anything. You know, the world, the gold and the silver, and all I have is yours for the asking and my love. My love in my heart that overflows. Clodagh, darling, ask me and I'll snatch a star to put in your hair. I'll waft clouds around your shoulder and have the night to cloak you in midnight and make all the... Why, hello there, shape. Now, fancy bumping into you when you were the last person in the world I was looking for. And how are you, Seamus? Oh, not so well, Danny. It is hard enough for a poor old man to make a living without half the police following him. And them Irish, too. <laughs> but what do you care for the police? A man who can open any safe in the world. I should have followed your bent. Getting people to see locks opened is a good deal better off than the one who opens them in secret and hopes to find the pay inside. Ah, how true, how true. Of course, should a man know, know there is no danger whatsoever, then maybe to open a safe would be a pleasure. It would be a glory. I happen to have heard that a certain McGill, that black-hearted key shopper, will not be in his office at about seven o'clock on a night one week from this day. Is that so? Is that so? And Seamus, I happen to hear that should anybody open his safe one week from tonight, he would find a thousand dollars inside it. Ah, me, what a pity. It is a great pity indeed. The McGill lock is one of the most intricate in the world. It defies all cracksmen and would not be worth the trouble for one thousand dollars. Oh, it would not be worth the trouble at all. Silly of me, you know, how I mention $1,000 when I really mean two. Danny, you moan to me. Then you hum. Would you not be after singing now? 2500 and that's my top note. And beautiful it is, true and sweet. 
Mr. McGill's safe, if it had not hinges, would be an uncorked bottle. This night in one week's time. Uh, about seven, you said? About seven. I'll be after going and getting a little practice. Sure, it's a formidable assignment to be opening Mr. McGill's personal safe. Good, Mansell, good. I'm sure, but Mr. McGill, I heard them both talking. Danny Cash is a four-flusher, eh? Double act. <laughs> well, I'm surprised I didn't tumble to it before, though I had my suspicions. Of course, Mr. McGill. Switches. <laughs> though I wonder when he does it. Mansell, there's half a million dollars resting on this, and so much publicity, I can't let him win. Mansell, I'm not going to let him win. No, Mr. McGill. I want you to go to Danny Cash. Say to him, McGill's scared. Tell him I want to see him here in my office. Tell him I'm willing to call the whole thing off and give him a cash bonus into the bargain. Yes, Mr. McGill. Tell him to be here one week from tonight, five o'clock. And Mansell, I want to show you just how this safe of mine works. <laughs> I want you to study it well. It closes like this. more than dexterity you need to beat McGill. His lock is punk, and he's beaten already. Clodagh, dear, every man has his price, and every man his pattern. McGill has kept more than one man quiet by a device you'd expect him to use. He'll beat you. So he will. But being beaten doesn't matter, so long as you win. And the loser of this little epic will lose the lock. An escapologist or a lockmaker, neither of us could stand up to the publicity blast, should he lose. Therefore, I'm not going to lose. If you lose, we won't have the clothes we stand up in. As good an excuse as any to go to bed. Now, don't you worry. Clodagh, love, tonight you'll be worth one million dollars. Goodbye, sweetheart. Where are you going? McGill, the great man, has spoken. He wants me at his office. What for? He says because he's scared and wants to pull out. I say because he's scared and wants me to pull out. <laughs> pull out, put out, like a candle. Snuff. Don't go, Danny. Stay. Don't go to McGill or the theater. Light of my love, I've got to. There's nothing so poor as a frightened man. Besides, I'd like to retire before anybody discovers how I do my escapes. Now, don't you worry. You'll be at the theater at eight and watch your Danny live up to his name. See you later, sweetheart. <laughs> Good evening to you, Mr. McGill. Uh, to you, Mr. Manson. Sit down, Cash. I'll stand. A standing man has the quicker getaway. Cash, you're a dangerous man to me. And danger, if it can't be avoided, must be eliminated. A big business can't afford to be held to ransom by one man. Then pay me. Pay me and let me go. I'm not greedy. I'll take the 500000 you're going to lose tonight anyway. Well, I sent for you because I know you are greedy. If you weren't, you wouldn't have come. And I also know you'll be scared. After I tell you a few facts. <coughs> yes, in a moment, Mansell. So to get over your greed and the scare that's going to come to you, I'm willing to pay you $5,000. For that, all you have to do is announce that you're ill, that you can't go ahead with tonight's performance. And if I won't? Then I'll have to scare you. If it's your face you're thinking of, I've got used to it. Tell him, Mansell. Mr. Cash, you're a fraud. You do your escape act by using a double, your own brother. Identical twins, I believe. Somehow, during the performance, you switch so that one of you appears, appears to have escaped. I suppose the other removes his chains or padlock or whatever it is at his leisure. Unmasked. Quite so. So, I think it's all perfectly plain. Either you take Mr. McGill's very generous offer, or you... Oh, your brother dies tonight. You couldn't do it. You couldn't be such fiends. The safety of the McGill commercial empire is far more important than a mere individual. But to let my brother die horribly suspended head first in a tank of water would be too inhuman, too ghastly. Even if the water is warmed. I don't think we need bother about all that cash. Take my offer and get out. No. 
No, I owe it to my public. The show must go on. Nonsense. Cash, you don't seem to realize the seriousness of my intentions. To uphold the McGill name, I warn you I don't mind what lengths I have to go to. Be wise, Mr. Cash. No. Sorry. I'm always ready to bargain with sensible people. But as you're not, then I have no alternative. Will you walk into my safe, or do Mansell and I have to carry you? No. No, not that. Please, Cash, no shouting. The staff have all gone, and beyond us three, there is nobody. All right. All right, you win. Oh, sorry, Cash, you've had your chance. I never go back once my mind is made up. The safe, please. Reconsider. Think. My wife... You should have thought of her before. The safe, please. I'll fight. You'll have to beat me first. Mansell. Can't I persuade you, Mr. Cash? As Mr. McGill says, once his mind is made up... Very well. But you haven't heard the last of this. Will I be able to breathe? It has been occupied before. The last man was still alive after 12 hours. We'll let you out after you fail to appear at the theater. All right, close the door, Mansell. Pleasure. I warn you, I can escape from anything. I can... think we're being wise, Mr. McGill. After all, if his brother does go ahead and gets drowned... <laughs> no, don't be silly. Would you if you were his brother? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, there's no danger. With him locked up, there's no danger to McGill Incorporated either. Come on. Mr. McGill... Mrs. Cash, I've come to warn you to call the whole thing off. One of the brothers, I don't know whether it's Danny or the other, won't be appearing tonight. If the other brother was so stupid as to go ahead, he'd most certainly die in that tank of water. Danny would never forgive me. If he were dead, he hardly could. I have half a million dollars to protect, and now I know Danny pulls the switcheroo, I'm going to protect it at any cost. Although, mind you, I've no objection to taking Danny's money. <laughs> With half a million, I could open a new branch. <laughs> and if you lost, you'd have to close more than an old branch. No, Mr. McGill. Danny wants to go ahead, and I'm not going to stop him. Very well, Mrs. Cash. I win. I only hope you don't lose a great deal more than cash. Good evening. Oh, come, come, my beauty. I'm treating you tenderly enough. Come now, open up. Oh, sure, and what do you want to be difficult for? Give up your secret. Be generous now. What oh, as gentle I've been, and as careful as you were a gardenia petal, and I... There now. It wasn't so hard, was it? And a very good evening to you, Danny boy. And the same to you, Seamus. Very nice. Were you comfortable? A man can sleep here. It's quiet. And one place a wife, a wife could not get at him. Thank you, Seamus. You'll pardon me, but I have an important date at the theater. Of course. After a little matter of $3,000 has been settled. 2500 Seamus. Oh, yes. But what is 500 Nothing, Seamus. That's why you're not getting it. 100 2 3 Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, I challenged Danny Cash that he could not open my latest lock. He, in fact, was so sure he could, he agreed to try while suspended headfirst in this, this glass tank submerged in water. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to say Danny must have had a change of heart because he hasn't turned up. As you see, on this side, under guard is my half million saying Danny couldn't. On that side, his half million saying he could. <laughs> well, as he hasn't turned up under the rules of the county... What? What? Ladies and gentlemen, a slight delay, but nothing of importance. With your kind permission, I will now demonstrate just how ineffectual Mr. McGill's lock is. Where'd you get to, Danny? 
Miss McGill's been making awful threats. Don't worry about that, darling. There's something else on my mind. What, dear? What is it? Has that water been heated? Wish me luck. Luck, luck, luck. Mrs. Cash. Mrs. Cash. He, he's not really going ahead with it. If he's not, he's putting up quite a show. But uh, I, 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 I happen to know. Mrs. Cash, his brother isn't here. He won't be able to switch. Uh, though how he was going to, I wouldn't know. But uh, Mrs. Cash, you, you, you've got to stop him. There'll be a terrible tragedy. Mr. McGill, when it comes to a million dollars, I don't interfere with anybody. And it'll be too late now, anyhow. Oh, dear. He'll never do it. Never. He'll drown. Five seconds. Ten. Upside down in a glass tank. He hasn't got a chance. Not a chance. He, he, he can't do it. Half a minute. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh. Darling, I never thought you'd do it. Give me my dressing gown. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I thought I was going to die in there. Die? The water wasn't heated. Hello, Miguel. Thought I couldn't do it, eh? That's half a million of your money says I did. I get it. I get it. A frame. You're yourself. You never had a brother. Got out of the safe, eh? Came here. All right, you pulled a clever one. Let Mansell think you had a brother. Let him tell me and let me bet half a million. Oh, <laughs> clever, all right. Let me tell you, I'll fight you to the death, beyond if need be. Somehow, I'll get squared with you. If it's the last thing I do, I'll get you, Danny Cash. He will. He means it. Doesn't matter. From now on, I'm retired. Hey, get those guards around that million. Have a guard until the armored car comes to take it to the safe deposit. Come on, honey. Get changed and let's get out of here. I've never been so scared. Nor has McGill. He thought he'd murdered you. I wasn't too happy myself. If Seamus hadn't been a real master locksmith, it might have ended differently. A million. We always said we'd make a million, and we have. And don't try to make it too. No fear. It's Europe for us. And an everlasting holiday. No more dressing rooms, no more escapes. We really freed ourselves this time. Hello, Danny. Finnegan, get me out of these padlocks. McGill's made a good job, Rick, and the only way I'll get free is by a hacksaw. Oh, I only just made it. Another two minutes, and I'd have been too late to make the switch. Here, try Seamus's master key. Maybe that'll unlock these. A closing door finishes a story. Next week, another key will open another door to another story. Mystery. Romance. Or adventure. All start when a door is unlocked by... The Key. Ironized Yeast presents Lights Out, Everybody. It is later than you think. Lights Out brings you stories of the supernatural and the supernormal. Dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. 
this is Arch Obler. If you don't mind, I'm not going to tell you anything about the story we're going to do in a few minutes. Neither the title, nor anything about the characters, nor even the usual remark about any similarity of this story to real events and actual people occurring, so on and so forth. Nope. We're just going to tell you a strange story. But first, Bob Stevenson. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about you. If you're so unattractively thin and jittery and run down that you're really only half living, maybe it simply means you're not getting enough vitamin B and iron from your food. If that's it, don't pin your hopes on halfway help. Get ironized yeast. It's a two-way tonic. It gives you both vitamin B and iron. Thousands of weary, worn-out men and women who only needed more of these substances are singing its praises. These folks tell us how quickly ironized yeast has helped them gain the grand new pounds, the glorious new pep and strength and sparkle they needed to really enjoy living. Remember that name, ironized yeast. And now, lights out, everybody. Hello? Hello, police head... Police department? My name is Charles Crager. Dr. Charles Crager. I live at 872 West Street, apartment 2B. I want you to come and get me. I... I've just killed a man. Jay Drogan. Did you hear me? I said, come and get me. I just killed a man. His name was... willing to bet on it. I'm willing to... I'm telling you, sure as my name is Jay Drogan, I'm gonna drink this. Jay, forget it, will you? You better lie down and get some rest. Let me alone. Take your hands off me. I said I was gonna drink this mess, and I'm gonna drink it. Right out of the cocktail sticker. Mm. Ah. He's really drinking it. Holy cats, look at him. <clears throat> oh, boy. Oh, that was terrific. How, how did it taste? Wonderful. I... I... Uh... Jay! He's sick. No, no, I, I'm all right. Hot in here. Window. One window open. The windows. Who broke all the windows? Got to get up, get to work. Oh, oh, oh! Huh? All dressed, bed in my clothes. Put me to bed. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, oh! All right, all right, all right. Hello, Jay Drogan speaking. Who? Oh yeah, yeah hello, friend. Sure, sure, I'm coming down to the office. Party? All right, all right. A man got to have some fun once in a while, can't he? I got to wash up. I... All right, I'll be down here. Goodbye. Son of a... Where's my hat? Well... What? Windows? Broken? <laughs> some party. Uh, tell superintendent get windows fixed. Wonder what... Oh, well. Gotta get to the office. Good thing building has an elevator. Couldn't walk downstairs. Oh, good morning then, Mr. Drogan. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Jensen. I was and just... What the devil's the matter with this elevator? I've been punching this button for five minutes. Well, it takes time for it to come down when it's up on the top floor. It takes the time The devil for... with the time. It's always going wrong, that elevator. I wish that blasted thing would fall through the basement. Hey, it's falling. It... It fell... Just like you said. Oh, then, Drogan, sit down. Sit down. Thank you, Doctor. It was good of you to see me without an appointment. Well, you seem to be in quite a state. What is it? It's, uh, it's my head. You injured it? No, no, uh, I don't think so. You see, I had a little party at my house last night. Oh, my 
Kid. <laughs> oh, never mind. Never mind. Oh, this certainly is the morning after the night before. Over to the window and let me look at you. Yes, Doctor. It's it's my head, Doctor. Every sound... It's just the morning after. But every sound... That blasted airplane up there, it's so loud in my head, no, Doctor. No, I... don't get excited. Why does that infernal pilot have to fly so low? Blast you up there, why don't you crack up? Look. He's falling. Falling? What... What you said, Drogan... Really happened. Step back now. Keep away. Keep away. All right, Jorgen. We, we better be moving on. Yeah. You come back to my office and I'll give you a sedative and you lie down and rest a little while and then you'll be all right. Yeah. Coincidences. That's nothing all. That's all it was. Nothing more. But watch out, man. Watch out where you're walking. It's okay. Mm. It's okay. And now we can cross. Hey, you! How do you like that guy? Blasted cabs, they think they own the street. If I had my way, I'd smash them all up. Doc! Doc! It's happened. Again. Drink this. No. I tell you, drink this. I don't want to. It isn't what you want to do. It, it's a sedative. Now, drink it. Putting me to sleep for a little while is no now, help. Last night. Think about last night. Perhaps you, well, drank something out of the ordinary. Huh? Well, why do you look at me like that? I... I did. What? Uh, that drink, I... I just remember. Tell me. But, but that couldn't be it. Tell me. Well... We got a kidding about who could mix the most unusual drinks, and I was feeling high, and I mixed one. Well, what was in the drink? I... I don't know. Well, you must know. If I knew what was in the drink, perhaps some chemical... Oh, wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? To the office. Well, what... Fred, my business. I, I've got this... No. Are you completely out of your head? You're a menace, a walking danger. Don't you realize that you can't go out of here until we figured this out, some way to stop it? If you don't, every time you say a negative thought, it'll happen and someone will die. Do you want that? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Why should you laugh? Stop it. Stop it. Well, it's funny. I go to see my doctor because I'm going out of my head and he goes out of his head. But what happened to you that all of a sudden I heard you should... you said that I was a menace. When you said that, all at once everything cleared up. What? Yeah. <laughs> Me, a menace. That's the funniest thing anybody ever said about me. Look at me. No hair, half my teeth aren't my own. I've cut a pot belly and I'm a menace. Yeah, you a doctor who's supposed to judge things only by facts suddenly decide I'm a menace. Why? Because three screwy things happened that I had nothing to do with. And that I had nothing to do with. Coincidences. Like getting four aces two times running or... Rolling seven twenty-five times in a row or anything else where two and two doesn't add up to four. That that elevator would have fallen anyway, and, and that plane, so his mo motor cut out just when I said it. And, and the cabs, we were both so scared that we ran off without finding out whether or not there was a good reason why three cabs smashed up. Sure, cabs have accidents all the time. So, well, does that make me a menace? I ask you, is that the way for a doctor to talk? I'm sorry. Of course you're right. I've been talking like an emotional moron. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? I'm the man who has always evaluated situations through factual evidence. And even then, I've retained some measure of skepticism because I know how, well, how misleading human observation can be. Trogan, would you mind shaking hands with a blasted fool? Sure, Doc. And you're shaking hands with one, too. Uh, now, if you don't mind, can I use your telephone? Sure. Of course, of course. I've got to call my office, explain why I'm late. Oh, had me scared for a while. Hello. Hello, that you, Fred? Yes, I'm on my way in. But I, I tell you, I'll be there in a few minutes. But I'm telling you. I know, I know, but I'm coming. Oh, stop yelling at me. Why don't you drop dead? Fred. Hey, Fred. What's the matter? What's the matter? Why, I don't know. One minute I was talking to him, and then... Fred, Fred, answer me. 
No, it can't be. You're lying. Hello? Hello? Grogan, what is it? Tell me. Someone said... Fred just dropped dead. Ladies and gentlemen, to stop a suspense story may seem an intrusion. But before going on with the story of this strange little miracle man, perhaps a breath or two of relaxation is indicated. Yes, before going on with our lights out story of the projective Mr. Drogan, let's turn to a problem of these hectic times. We have a very troubled young lady here. Trouble's no word for it. My boss wants to give me a dandy new job, but I'm so tired out and run down and jittery, I'm afraid I couldn't handle it. I'm getting much too thin. And I've tried every tonic I know, but nothing I try seems to help me. Well, miss, maybe you just haven't tried the right tonic. Maybe more vitamin B and iron's what you need. Vitamin B and iron? Could that make such a difference? Well, when you don't get enough vitamin B from your meals, you may lose your appetite... Eat so poorly that you lose weight and strength. Or you may not get all the good out of what you do eat. And when you don't get enough iron from your food, you may be weak and pale and feel only half alive. How can I get more vitamin B and iron if I need them? The quickest, easiest way I know is take ironized yeast tablets. They give you both vitamin B and iron. And pleasant little ironized yeast tablets are a cinch to take. But uh, are they terribly expensive? Oh, not a bit of it. They cost but a few pennies a day. So try ironized yeast tablets if more vitamin B and iron is what you need. Then see if pretty quick you aren't saying... Tired? Not me. I'm so full of pep now I hardly know myself. And I've gained pounds. Why didn't somebody tell me about ironized yeast tablets ages ago? And now, back to lights out. At the moment when both Drogan and the doctor had rationalized the miracles into coincidences, another miracle had taken place. Another miracle of death. And now the men sit in the doctor's office, and there is great fear in both of them. What... What time is it, doctor? One... I can't just sit here. No, no, you're you're my responsibility. I, I've got to think something out. I, I just can't keep on not thinking anything. Great Godfrey, what, what's the matter with me? You can perform miracles. I'm convinced of that. All right. Then why, in the name of common sense, can't you perform positive miracles instead of negative ones? I, I don't understand. Listen to me. It, it's simple. It's so simple that neither one of us thought of it. Just as you can kill people and cause accidents, why can't you do good? Good? Yes, good. Heal the sick, give eyes to the blind. But when it comes to killing, kill the ones who should be killed. Well, that's right. Maybe I could do that. Hitler, 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 Mussolini. Why, you could wipe out the whole Nazi army by just saying so. Yeah, but, but how would we know? Now, wait a minute. It's all clear now. Every miracle that you performed today was a negative miracle. The falling elevator, the airplane, the taxis, your friend. Everything negative. You haven't performed a single positive miracle. Not a miracle for good instead of evil. Well, come with me. Where? Out on the street again. Come on, Drogan. We've got to find out if you can perform a good miracle just as easily as performing the other kind. And if you can, well, you'll start making history in a few minutes, Mr. Drogan. Now, what? On the corner, the newsman. He's blind. Well, don't be stupid. We'll go over to him. Faber? Faber, get your paper. Hello, Tom. That you, doctor? Yes, give me a magazine. Well, anyone will do. Yes, sir. Wish it, Drogan. Wish that he could see. I am, I am. Hey, uh, doctor. How have you been? Oh, never mind about me. How about you? Huh? How about your eyes? Are you kidding? Drogan, out loud. You've got to say it out loud. Hey, Doc, what's the matter? Say it. I wish that he could see. 
Hey, what, what's going on here? Tom, you see. You do see. What's the matter with you, Doc? You can see. Let me alone, will you? What, what are you trying to do? What, what are you after? Can you see? Oh. Oh, I can't see. Get the devil away from here. I can't see. All right, Ruben. Come on. Yeah. What does it mean? Whatever you want to do that's good doesn't happen. But whatever you say that's evil happens. God help you, Drogan. Well, I know what you've been just going to Well, have a good sleep, friend Drogan? Yeah. Why? Why did I fall asleep? A sedative I gave you. Oh. Drogan, I want you to meet my wife. How do you do? Well, well it's a pleasure, Mrs. Craker. Yeah. Let me give you a hand. No, no, no. I'm all right. Yeah, of course. Uh, Drogan, I've told the entire story to my wife. She's clear-headed about this. I'll let her tell you what she thinks. Go ahead, Anne. Mr. Drogan, Charles thinks you're a menace to humanity. I don't think so. I think the danger to others is not through you, but through somebody else. You don't know what I mean, well... That's understandable. I mean, you wouldn't willfully hurt anyone. But what if someone forced you to? What if your ability to perform miracles... Evil miracles? Yes, evil miracles, was discovered by some criminal. He would force you to do what he wanted, at no risk to himself, because since the criminal was performing an evil act, you couldn't hurt him. In other words, Drogan, someone could use you for criminal purposes... Yes, blackmail the world because you thought he could kill anyone in the world. You haven't said anything, Mr. Drogan. You do understand? Yes, I, I understand. What do you expect me to do about it? We don't expect you to do anything. The responsibility is beyond you or us. Whatever happens is up to the proper authorities. Uh, authorities? What we must do is to tell the authorities of what happened. It's a... Wonderful idea. What did you say? It's a wonderful idea. Charles, I told you he'd understand. Trogan, I'm proud of you. Thank God it happened to a man like you instead of another little fascist who'd imagine himself a super Hitler. A wonderful idea. Yes, yes, of course, but why do you keep on saying that? You gave me a wonderful idea. <laughs> Thank you, but that's not important now. We've got to go to the authorities. All of us. No. Why should you say no? I- I'm not going anywhere. Neither are you. What? Charles, why should he say... Wait. What's the matter? Nothing. I'm not going any place, or you. What do you mean? Sit down. What the devil for? Sit down. Now, I don't see what... Doctor, I'll let you talk. Now, let me. Well, in my own way, I figured out the world a long time ago. And that's why I was satisfied. Now, you see, it's like this. Some people are born with more than other people. One man has more brains, so he's an Einstein. Another fellow's born with good looks, so so he's a movie star like that that, that Taylor fellow. Another has muscles that work better, so he's a Joe Lewis. Another one's got more energy, so he's an Edison. Most people are born with just enough brains and muscles to get along in a plain, ordinary life like me. I knew that. So I was satisfied. Then then this happened to me. All at once, all I've got to do is say something, and, and then it happens. Not good things, we found that out, but whatever I say that's wrong happens. I can do what anybody else in the world would like to do but can't do. No army or navy or air force. I can say that somebody should die or, or that something should, should burn or break or fall, and it happens. At first, it was the same for me as for you, Doctor. I I couldn't believe it was really so. Then, then while I was lying here, I heard you and your wife talking, and I began to figure things out. And then you both gave me the real idea. Dempsey and Joe Lewis and Tunney and those fellows who had better muscles made themselves millions. So did Edison and Ford and, and Chrysler and the rest of them who had brains. 
Now, I had something. Why shouldn't I get paid off, too? Paid off? That's right. How? Y you said it before. What? Uh, I think you call it blackmail. Charles! Well, the way you both look at me, you'd think I'd said something you hadn't said before yourself. Anybody that's any good to the world, I can kill. All right. As people get paid off in this world for not letting other people starve, so I'll get paid off for not making people die. That's a pretty bad joke. Joke? No. Of course you're joking. No. You don't mean that. Sit down, doctor. Doctor, I said for you to sit down. Don't you order me around. Now stop this nonsense and... Oh. I brought you some tea, Mrs. Crager. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Frederick. Just put the tray Wait down. a minute. Uh, take that tray out of here. Go ahead, take it out. But I... I take orders only from Mrs. Crager. Is that so? Well, why don't you die? He's dead, isn't he, Doctor? Yes. So you see, it isn't nonsense. You devil, you! Well, up to now, it's always been plain Sam. I never thought that you... That's just it. You should never underestimate a little man, now, now should you? Charles, do you hear me call the police? He hears you, but he won't do anything about it, will you, Charles, doctor? don't just sit there. This man is a murderer. He killed doctor, Frederick. Doctor, your you wife is talking a little too much, isn't she? Why do you sit she? there? Won't you please? Doctor, do you hear me? Doctor. I suggest you tell your but wife you to shut me. her mouth. Charles, Or maybe you'd like me to say something to her. The words I said about the servant. you call the Suppose I said, Mrs. Craker, I wish you would... Stop. Will you please do something about And stop it. Stop. You hear me? Stop. Now, it'll be all right, dear. It'll be all right. Of course it will. As long as we're sensible about this. Now, then, what is my plan? A very simple thing. You and your wife are going to help me get everything in the world that I want. Yes, everything. What I tell you to do, you will do. Um, uh, letters. I, I will decide on three influential gentlemen in our government three wealthy gentlemen in industry to whom you will send letters explaining about me. Now, they won't believe, but at the time I tell them to, they'll die, and the newspapers will know about it. And after that, everyone will believe me, now, won't they? And so as not to die, everyone will do exactly as I want, won't they? Because they won't have any choice in the matter. If they send soldiers against me, I'll wish that they'll be dead, and, and they will be dead. And soon, from Washington to London to Moscow... Everyone will be doing exactly what Sam Drogan wants them to do. And that'll be wonderful, won't it? All the good people of the world doing exactly what one little man wants them to do. Well, you haven't said anything, Doctor. You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. It was inevitable. Of course, I, I won't want you and your wife to leave here. Now then, we, we'd better have this man's body removed, and then we'd better get to work. Or have you any suggestions? Do you mind if I have a drink? Drink? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. A drink started all this, didn't it? <laughs> Go right ahead, Doctor. Thank you. A and you, Mrs. Crager, you're quite all right now, aren't you? Yes, I'm sure you are, the way you sit there looking at me. You and your husband will do exactly as I say, because you're both good people, and I'm death to good people, and you know that now, don't you? Yes, I'm sure my wife knows that. Your drink. Oh, yes. Oh, and quite a full one. Thank you, Doctor. I, uh, I drink to, to your continued good health. <clears throat> uh, uh, well, a strong one and a good one. Thank you, Doctor. I, uh, I, what, drink, oh, my throat, you, you put, no, wouldn't dare. I'll kill... Charles, what did you... Kill... Kill... Charles, he's going to... Wait. I wish you... slowly than should have, but it worked. Drogan, you made one mistake. You should never underestimate what good people can do, if they have to. Mr. Obler... 
Mr. Obler. I know how you feel, but in these times of stress and strain, the tensions of life do pile up for all of us. And once in a while, it's a welcome let-up to think of miracles and miracle men. A miracle man who can solve all things with a wish and a wave of the hand. Of course, we know now that miracles actually do happen with work and with the will of a fighting people. Which brings us to next week. I'll tell you about that after you've had your say. Well, I just want to clear up a point for our listeners. Friends, we've told you about ironized yeast. We've told you, too, how thousands who only needed more vitamin B and iron today thank ironized yeast tablets for helping them gain glorious new strength and pep, and five, ten, even more pounds of good new flesh. But did you know that you can try ironized yeast tablets on a no-risk, money-back basis? Yes, if you don't quickly begin to eat better, sleep better, feel your old-time, peppy, happy self again, in short, if you're not 100% pleased with the results, the cost of the first bottle will be refunded to you in full by ironized yeast, box IY, Rowie, New Jersey. So, if you need more vitamin B and iron, get the one and only ironized yeast tablets right away, tonight. And next week? Well, next week, very simply, I like stories of escape. I always have. My typewriter likes them. My shorthand book likes them. My stenographer likes them. My dictaphone likes them. I think other people feel the way I do. In childhood, we like to read of escape from galloping Indians, and as we grow older, escape from uh, pursuing love. And we grow older than that, uh, other more subtle escapes. Well, by this time, you ought to know that next week's story is one of escape. Its title is Until Dead. And I've promised myself and you a suspenseful and amazing half hour, but as usual, that's next week. Yes, tune in next Tuesday again. For Arch Ogler's eerie story, Until Dead. And if you need more vitamin B and iron, be sure to try ironized yeast. The one and only ironized yeast with the big letters IY on the package and on each tablet. Plenty of men around who will tell you the nicest thing next to their face in the morning is Mole Brushless Shaving Cream. For that's the sign of a smooth, comfortable shave ahead. Mole, you see, is the shaving cream that helps guard your face against painful nicks and cuts by forming a protective film between your skin and your razor. You get a close shave and a mighty comfortable one, too. So get Mole, M O L L E, and be on the receiving end of a swell shave every morning yourself. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Network presents, in special performance, Macabre. Tonight's story, The Avenger. The 
night is warm and dark, except for the moon vainly trying to pierce a thickening sky. There is a lonely light in the library window at Hale Manor, outside in the vine-strewn garden. A dark figure steals quietly to the flagstone terrace, pauses as if sniffing a scent, and then moves in an animal crouch toward the light in the window. Dr. Burton Hale sits in the library, reading, unaware that had he glanced at the window, he might have seen something pass, something with a frightful look, something that now was trying the knob of the French doors leading from the terrace to the library. Who's there? Who's there, I say? Strange, it sounded like someone on the terrace. Perhaps I'd better see. Is anyone out there? Who is on this terrace? Dan Forrest. Dan, what the quick? I'll be in. What's wrong with you, Dan? Time to talk. Lock the door. Turn off the light. Now, just a minute. Do as I say, Doc. Good. See anything out the window? What am I supposed to look for? I'm serious. Something tried to kill me. I barely made it over here. You're overwrought. Sit down, Dan. I'll get you a sedative. I'm a friend in trouble, not a patient, Doc. Have you been drinking? That's a great idea. Scotch. Make it big. All right. You could use one. Have a seat. I'll be with you in the middle. Yeah. Thanks. I'm not trying to find your personal affairs, Dan, but I really think you owe me an explanation. Yeah, I do. I've known you 20 years. You're as sound as a dollar. What makes you think that someone is trying to kill you? Judge for yourself. Started yesterday morning. I was crossing 3rd Avenue. I just stepped off the curb and a parked cab tried to run me down. No uh, coincidence. Wait, there's more. Today, had a construction project, a beam slipped from a crane. Almost crushed me. Damn, accidents will happen. It doesn't stop there. Tonight, I left my hotel room about eight. I walked past a dark alley, a shot rang out. Bullet missed my inches. I hopped into my car, made a bad dash for your place. But whatever is after me followed, it's out there in your garden. Oh, this shot may have been a backfire. With a ricochet? Have you any idea who it might be? No. Dan, people need reasons to kill. You've never hurt anyone in your whole life. You're alarmed over a set of coincidences. I tell you something followed me here. Could have been a policeman. You know, you did look like a burglar. I was afraid I'd be a target in front, so I came through the garden. What's that? Came from the terrace. Where are you going? Stay back. I'll have a look. What do you see? Be quiet, Dan. Was it anything? Couldn't tell. Flower pot overturned. Probably just a dog. Uh, sure. Dog's gonna climb that eight foot wall out there. You won't be satisfied until I call the police. No, we can't do that. Then there's something you haven't told me. That's right, Doc. If attempts are being made in your life, they must be stopped. I didn't want to believe this myself. Now it's clear. You remember the trip I made to Africa last year? Yes, you were doing research for a book. We'd stopped for the night at the edge of a village deep in the jungle. After supper, I decided to go for a walk. It was a hot, stifling night. Another member of our party, Jeff Clayton from London, joined me. For some reason, our conversation drifted. I'm about the natives in this section. They don't seem unfriendly. But one never can tell. And that's why I pack an old map on field trips such as this, just in case. We've uh, walked far enough, Jeff. We don't want to get too far from camp. Oh, it's all right. Better start back. You know, mosquitoes starting in. You know, speaking of natives, we haven't seen a single one tonight. They don't see many white men in this area. They're very likely avoiding us. Wait. I caught the trees. Why should I go over there? Right, huh? Yeah. Looks like a temple. Mm -hmm. Come on. Let's see what it is. Take these, Dan. They are sometimes sticky about their temples. You'll just have a look. There's no harm in that. No, I guess not. How do you suppose they got all the white stone? It's all in white. Well built, too. But for a primitive native tribe, you might say so. They can be deucedly clever in certain ways. There it is. Look here, I don't mean to cry wolf, Dan, but the, the missing natives are, are not, not so missing now. Two are staring from those bushes. Tell them we're just admiring their craftsmanship. Let's go inside. Hold it, Dan. One of the natives is motioning to us. Don't, don't go in, Dan. He's waving you off. I, I told you they'd be sticky about this. Entertain him, Jeff. He's more your type. Take on him, Ola. I'll just glance inside. Don't, Dan. Come back. There'll be trouble. You're violating their sacred temple. Now, now, 
how you've done it. I, I don't know what they're chanting, but it's no lullaby. Quick, come out of their tent. Come on, get out of their tent. Then, remarkable structure for the middle of a jungle. Let's, let's make a break for it. Uh-oh. They stopped the chant. An old man in a robe. He's walking toward us. White man, go in sacred temple. White man, evil. He speaks good English. He's probably taught by a missionary. Only spirits go in temple. White man, die. Here it comes, that old hookum. Spirits, angry. Say a white man, die. Twelve full I say, old man, let's get back to the camp before they get fired. I was to return, return to the camp. I didn't give it any further thought. I'm not superstitious. I don't believe in all that stuff anyway, Doc. I don't think it has any connection. Is that all? Not quite. In researching the temple, I'll learn something else about this particular tribe that might have a bearing. When anyone harms them, they either kill him on the spot or send a sort of avenger to perform a ceremonial execution rite. They track one man to South America. I forgot the whole thing until yesterday. It looks as if they didn't, though. Tomorrow is the twelfth full moon since I went into that temple. From all appearances, something is after me. Have you told anyone else about these attacks on your life? No, there were no witnesses. The police would say coincidence. And so would I. You're a fine mystery writer. Why don't you leave the plots on the bookshelves where they belong? I know. That's why I've kept it to myself. I don't want to be a laughingstock. Just think. Mystery writer Daniel Forrest takes plots seriously. <laughs> Runs from the Avenger instead of critics. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy, Dan. Say, where's Joanne? Waiting, I guess. I was on my way to see her when I panicked over the shot. Why don't you keep the date? Yeah, I think I will. And uh, thanks for listening to my troubles. Forget the other. It's sheer nonsense. What if it happens again? Then we might assume, might mind you, that your life is in danger. <laughs> You dance divinely, darling. Yeah, I guess I do. Dan, are you all right? Huh? You seem a thousand miles away tonight. Uh, look, young lady, I'm relaxing. Close your eyes and enjoy the music. You never did say why you were so late. Joanne, I have other things to do besides court you. I uh, was busy. Speaking of courting, we've known each other four months. We had planned to set a date. I hadn't forgotten. But it'll have to wait a few days until I... Settle something. My poor darling. You are worried. Tell me what it is. No, it's nothing, really. Then hold me close. You can't dance and worry, too. Joanne, I do love you. I might allow you to kiss me, if you tried. <sighs> Dan, was anyone supposed to meet you here tonight? Of course not. What a ridiculous question. I felt watched all evening. I told you not to wear that dress. I'm serious. Isn't that someone sitting at our table? Yeah. Would be in the shadows. Can't tell whether it's a man or woman. Come on. Such a crowd on the dance floor. Pardon us, please. May we get through? Hang on, I'll push. We're in a hurry. Let us by, please. There's our table, Dan. It's empty. They, they've gone. That's strange. We both saw someone sitting there, didn't we? I thought so. I could just have seen who... Look, a burning cigarette. There was someone here. Hmm. American brand. Doesn't tell us a thing. Dan, please. Is there anything wrong? Uh, I have to admit, Joanne. I'm afraid there is. Huh? What is it, darling? Take a cab and go straight home. Without you? Go ahead. I'll call in the morning and explain. But, Dan, I don't understand. You want to get home, don't you? Yes, of course. Go, I... Joanne, while you can. Before they decide to get you to... Never fails. Dead of night. Hello. Hello. Oh, did ring, didn't it? Hello. What? I thought it was someone. Hello. Who are you? Hello. May I help you? Who is this? The night clerk, sir. Have you finished your call? What call? What the devil are you talking about? Someone phoned you, sir. I rang your room and left the line when you answered. Who was it? 
Sorry, sir, they didn't say. Who didn't say? A man or a woman? Really, sir, it was a horse twice. I, I, I couldn't say. Always get their names first, you understand? Yes, sir. Anything else, sir? Yeah. Get me Plymouth 50067. Yes, sir. Call it imagination for like No mistake now. They're after me. Who could it be? I have the slightest idea. Hello? Hi, Doc. Dan. Oh. Are you all right? Yeah, but they're closing in. Any further developments? Watched us all evening. Someone just called me about hotel room. Oh, who? Hung up without speaking. I have no idea. Uh-huh. Still doesn't prove anything, Dan. Might be a prankster. No one else knows anything about the Temple episode, except you and Clayton. That's true. Tell you what. There's a little museum on the east side, specializes in African tribal relics, run by Professor Maringo. We'll go there in the morning. This professor is an authority on native superstitions. He may be able to help. Yeah. Thanks, Doc. And Dan, assuming what you said is true, we won't take any chances. Lock the windows and door. When I pick you up tomorrow, I want to find you alive. <laughs> Professor Moringo? Oh, Dr. Hale and Mr. Forrest. Come in, come in. We'll try not to take too much of your time. No, no, why don't you sit down? Ah, oh, thank you. I told you the basic problem on the phone. Mr. Forrest here can fill you in further. I've read your books, Mr. Forrest. Very good. Yes, indeed. What is happening to you is like a book come true. Improbable, but true. Are you familiar with the tribe I offended? Let me say I know something of them. The fact they are primitive in no way dulls the intensity for their way of life. They are a quiet, unassuming people, fervent believers in their own ideology. Mr. Forrest, do you know what spells and death prayers are? I have an idea. They are very real, indulged in by these primitive people. By these methods, they have been known to kill halfway around the world. I'm not saying you are under attack. However, if you violated the temple, you will not go free. A curse of 12 moons means you will die on the night of the 12th full moon. Or, pardon the direct reference, tonight. Now, I'm not telling you this will happen. I am I'm only saying it is possible. You think they meant what they said? I am afraid they do. I can tell you in a few moments if you are under a prayer of death. Princess Ulanga lives with me. I, I rescued her from this same tribe. She became an outcast for some reason and was about to be killed. Princess! Come here, my dear. Princess, this is Daniel Forrest. How do you do? <laughs> Excuse me. Before I could rescue her, they had cut out her tongue. God, you lord. Mr. Forrest violated your tribe's sacred temple. They have cursed him with death. Do you feel a spell on him? She says she will test you. Why is she staring? Why doesn't she tell us? What are they doing to me? Princess Sulaka, do you feel the death prayer? They ask her to hurry. She says, if they chant the prayer of death, she cannot feel it. That means I'm free. Doc, you hear that? Let's pick up Joanne. I promised I'd tell her as soon as we found out. Do not rejoice so hastily, Mr. Forrest. This test is not conclusive. But if the princess is right, it does not mean you are safe. It means they have used an alternate plan and dispatched an avenger. Well, right back where we started, eh? But there's still no evidence they plan to harm you. Maybe this is all wasted motion. 
we're taking it too seriously. What if they do? Then you're in a peculiar position, Dan. The Avenger may be a perfect stranger or anyone you've met in the past year. You'll have to be on guard against everyone. Even Joanne? Even Joanne. My God. It's frightening, Doc. Where are you meeting Joanne? At the low state. Uh, the theater? Yes, the great Cardona, a mentalist, is playing there. An old classmate of Joanne's. I thought he might be able to help me. I asked her to arrange an interview. Uh oh What's the matter? Count me in. What? I had to be sure, Dan. Now I am. Is that making sense? We're being followed. Where? Black sedan, second car back. I can't tell who's in it. Keep your appointment with Cardona. Then go to your hotel and stay there. I'll check with you later. If they move in, it'll be tonight. I'm glad you're with me. I'm a doctor. I'm with anyone, Dan, who's fighting for his life. Ah, you must be Mr. Forrest. I am Richard Cardona. How do you do? Joanne mentioned your problem. Would you step into my dressing room, please? Uh, and how have you been, Joanne? Fine, thank you. Be seated. What can I do for you, Mr. Forrest? Dan's in real trouble. He needs help, Dick. I'll do what I can. Ask me a question. I am a mentalist. All right. I think I'm being followed. Yes, you are. Who is it? Th that is not clear. I can't tell. Go on. Are they connected with an African native tribe? Uh, I see natives. Uh, I would say yes. What are the natives doing? They are busy. Busy? At what? Coming from a great distance. Hard to make it out. Please try, Dick. We have to know. What are they doing? Be perfectly still for a few moments. I'm quite tired, you know. Too tired, really, to perform feats of this kind. Uh, I'll concentrate once again. This time we may learn something. There is the village again. And a group of natives. They are chanting and dancing before a white temple. Yes, a white temple. The rite is called... Ah, there it fades again. What is it called? Do not interrupt it is called... Hmm, strange name. The Curse of the Twelve Moons. Oh, this couldn't possibly concern you, Mr. Forrest. I, I shouldn't invade the privacy of the right. What else can you see? It's merely a death watch common to the natives of the jungle. They're avenging themselves against an evildoer. Just a moment. I may be able to see more. L let me slip into a deeper trance. You really went into a deep one. Look how pale he is. That's dangerous. Dick, please be careful. What's he staring at? Dick, stop it. Come out of it. <sighs> I, I'm all right. What did you see? Joanne, do you love this man? Yes, I do. I ask you a question. My friend, I am sorry for you. For both of you. What did you see? The angel of death. You will die tonight. Hello? Dan? Any sign yet? No, Doc. Very quiet here. Good. Now stay in that hotel room and don't let anyone in. Understand? Your life may well depend on it. Doc, the windows and doors are locked. Barricaded. I'm sitting in the dark by the phone. If someone should get in, this 45 automatic will end his troubles. I'm across the street from your hotel at an all-night lunch counter. Your room is on the third floor. I, I can see the windows. I'll watch from here and call you back in case something does make a try for you. It's 11.30. Be careful and stay awake. I'm not likely to do anything else. Thanks, Doc. Don't let anyone in. That's very important. You've got to be realistic, Dan. We don't know who it is. I know. Good luck, my boy. Thanks. Bye, Doc. 
cops right. I'm in worse shape than a prisoner in the gas chamber. At least he knows who's going to kill him, how, and when. All I can do is sit in the dark and wait. Baby, my best friend. Anybody I've met since the trip last year. So Cinch, he'll try to get me through someone. If it's someone I don't know, he'll come through the windows of the door. If it's someone I do, he'll phone from the lobby. Try to come up. I just have to wait and see which it is. Full moon shining through the window shade. Curse of the twelve moons. Damn those superstitions. I didn't mean to hurt them. Why can't they forgive and forget? It's primitive gangsterism. That's it. Someone wanted to come up. Lord, I'm almost afraid to find out. Hello? Hello? Mr. Forrest, this is Richard Cardona. I am in the lobby of your hotel. I must see you at once. I'll bet he'd like to. I'm sorry, I can't be disturbed tonight. You're going to be executed in a matter of moments. I may be able to help. Good night, Mr. Cardona. And don't try to come up. First try. He may be the one. Can't be sure. But we'll know if he knocks on that door. I'll blast him to kingdom come. I'm waiting, Mr. Cardona. We'll see who's to be executed tonight. Cardona again. Now, look, you have... No time to talk. I'm Professor Marico. Princess Ulaga and I are in the lobby. I warn you. I won't listen to a thing you've got... Princess has changed her mind. The curse. You are marked for death. We are coming up. If you do, I'll kill you. Uh, that doesn't make sense. The three of them couldn't be mixed up in this. Or could they? Lord, it's so quiet up here. I know it's my imagination. I can almost make out headgear. Natives, witch doctors, watching from across the room. <laughs> Smells like leaves, flowers, jungle. Oh, God, it's not real. I could only turn on the light to be sure. Who? Who's that? Dan? Dan, it's Joanne. You've got to talk to me. Not Joanne, too. Can't be. Darling, Dr. Hale is with me in the lobby. Oh, God, both of them. Dan, Dan, I know you're there. Talk to me, please. We're all down here together, Dan. Don't be afraid. They're going to get you, but not through us. Not through them? Uh, of course not. What a fool I've been. I've sealed myself in a tomb. Darling, can't you hear me? There isn't any time left. We're coming up. The killer is already in your room. Oh, already here? Of course. For God's sake, yes! Hurry, Joanne! I see. Played right into their hands. Strap myself to the death chair. Quick, the light. What's that? Native chant of death? In this room? No. Stop. I've got a gun. Go ahead, Dad. A voice. Where are you? Right here. <laughs> Inside. Who, who are you? Man is really in two parts, Dad. Half Satan, half devil. You are commissioned to kill you. I don't believe you. <laughs> but you're right, man. It dropped the gun. Now, it reaches for the butcher tonight. You used to cut more bread. No, it won't. I'm stronger than you. Not against the prayer. <laughs> You're a weak dad. You should have spent more time developing your better half. This isn't real. I, I can't be struggling with myself. I'm not my own avenger. With my hand, the knife. <laughs> Moving towards our heart. No!
have just heard Macabre, a special Far East Network presentation. Tonight's story was The Avenger. In our cast were John Buey as Dr. Hale, June Elliott as Joanne, William Verdier as Dan, and Walt Sheldon as Professor Maringo. The great Cardona was Milton Radmilovich, and Airman First Class James Connolly was the hotel clerk. Technical supervision by Airman First Class Larry Dooley, with sound patterns by Airman First Class James Connolly. This is Air Force Sergeant Al LePage speaking. Macabre was written and directed by William Verdier. comes to you each week at this time through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. The story this time comes from the book Fun with Your New Head by Thomas M. Dish. A story which is entitled Descending. Ketchup, mustard, pickle relish, mayonnaise, two kinds of salad dressing, bacon grease, and a lemon. And, oh, yes, two trays of ice cubes. In the cupboard, it wasn't much better. Jars and boxes of spice, flour, sugar, salt, and a box of raisins. An empty box of raisins. Not even any coffee, not even tea, which he hated. Nothing in the mailbox but a bill from Underwood's. Four dollars and seventy-five cents in change jingled in his coat pocket, the plunder of the Chianti bottle that he had promised himself never to break open. He was spared the unpleasantness of having to sell his books. They had all been sold. 
The letter to Graham had gone out a week ago. If his brother intended to send him something this time, it would have come by now. I should be desperate, he thought. Perhaps I am. He might have looked in the Times, but no, that was too depressing, applying for jobs at $50 a week and being turned down. Not that he blamed them. He wouldn't have hired himself himself. He had been a grasshopper for years, and the ants were on to his tricks. Descending the stairway to the first floor, he encountered Mrs. Beale, who was pretending to sweep the well-swept floor of the entrance. Uh, good afternoon. I suppose it's good morning for you, huh? Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Beale. Uh, your letter come? No, not yet. I uh, remember the first of the month isn't far off. Mm, yes, indeed, Mrs. Beale. At the subway station, he considered a moment before answering the attendant. One token or two? And he decided two. After all, he had no choice but to return to his apartment. The first of the month was still a long way off. If Jean Valjean had had a charge account, he would never have gone to prison. And having thus cheered himself, he settled down to enjoy the ads in the subway car. Smoke. Try. Eat. Live. See. Drink. Use. Buy. At 34th Street, he got off and entered Underwood's department store directly from the train platform. Fancy Groceries was on five, and he made his selection judiciously. A jar of instant and a two-pound can of drip ground coffee, a large tin of corned beef, packaged soups and boxes of pancake mix and condensed milk, jam, peanut butter, and honey, six cans of tuna fish, and then he indulged himself in perishables, English cookies, and Edam cheese. A small frozen pheasant, even fruitcake. He never ate so well as when he was broke, and he couldn't afford to. After ringing up his charge, the clerk checked the number on his card against her list of closed or doubtful accounts. She smiled apologetically and handed the card back. The bag of groceries weighed a good 20 pounds carrying it with the exquisite casualness of a burglar passing before a policeman with his loot. He took the escalator to the bookshop on the eighth floor. His choice of books was determined by the same principle as his choice of groceries. First, the staples, two Victorian novels he had never read, Vanity Fair and Middlemarch, a Sayers translation of Dante, and a two-volume anthology of German plays, none of which he had read and few he had even heard of. And then The Perishables, a sensational novel that had reached the best-seller list via the Supreme Court, and two mysteries. He'd begun to feel giddy with self-indulgence, and he reached into his jacket pocket for a coin. Heads, a new suit, and tails, the sky room. Tails. The sky room on 15 was empty of all but a few women chatting over coffee and cakes. He was able to get a seat by a window. He ordered from the a la carte side of the menu and finished his meal with espresso and baklava. He handed the waitress his credit card and tipped her 50 cents. Over his second cup of coffee, he began Vanity Fair. And rather to his surprise, he found himself enjoying it. The waitress returned with his card and a receipt for the meal. Since the sky room was on the top floor of Underwoods, there was only one escalator to take now, descending. Riding down, he continued to read Vanity Fair. He could read anywhere, in restaurants and subways, even walking down the street. At each landing, he made his way from the foot of one escalator to the head of the next, without lifting his eyes from the book. When he came to the bargain basement, he would be only a few steps from the subway turnstile. He was halfway through Chapter 6, on page 55 to be exact, when he began to feel something amiss. How long does this damn thing take to reach the basement? He stopped at the next landing, but there was no sign to indicate on what floor he was, nor any door by which he might re-enter the store. Deducing from this that he was between floors, he took the escalator down one more flight, only to find the same perplexing absence of landmarks. There was, however, a water fountain, and he stopped to take a drink. I must have gone to a sub-basement, but this was not too likely, after all. Escalators were seldom provided for janitors and stock boys. 
He waited on the landing, watching the steps of the escalator slowly descend toward him, and at the end of their journey, telescope in upon themselves and disappear. He waited a long while, and no one else came down the moving steps. Perhaps the stores closed. Having no wristwatch and having rather lost track of the time, he had no way of knowing. At last he reasoned that he had become so engrossed in the Thackeray novel that he had simply stopped in one of the upper landings, say on eight, to finish a chapter and had read on to page 55 without even realizing that he was making no progress on the escalators. When he read, he could forget everything else. He must, therefore, still be somewhere above the main floor. The absence of exits, although disconcerting, could be explained by some quirk of the floor plan. The absence of signs was merely uh, carelessness on the part of the management. He tucked Vanity Fair into his shopping bag and stepped onto the grilled lip of the down-going escalator. Not, it must be admitted, without a certain degree of reluctance. At each landing, he marked his progress by a number spoken aloud. By eight, he was uneasy. By fifteen, he was desperate. It was, of course, possible that he had to descend two flights of stairs for every floor of the department store. And with this possibility in mind, he counted off fifteen more landings. Dazedly, and as though to deny the reality of this seemingly interminable stairwell, he continued his descent. When he stopped again at the 45th landing, he was trembling. He was afraid. He rested the shopping bag on the bare concrete floor of the landing, realizing that his arm had gone quite sore from supporting the 20 pounds and more of groceries and books. He discounted the enticing possibility that it was all a dream, for the dream world is the reality of the dreamer to which he could not weakly surrender, no more than one could surrender to the realities of life. Besides, he was not dreaming, of that he was quite sure. He checked his pulse. It was fast, say, 80 a minute. He rode down two more flights, counting his pulse. 80 almost exactly. Two flights took only one minute. He could read approximately one page a minute, a little less on an escalator. I suppose he had spent one hour on the escalators while he had read. 60 minutes, 120 floors, plus 47 that he had counted, 167. The sky room was on 15. 167 minus 15 equals 152. He was in the 152nd sub-basement. That was impossible. The appropriate response to an impossible situation was to deal with it as though it were commonplace. Ergo, he would return to Underwoods the same way he had, apparently, left it. He would walk up 152 flights of down-going escalators. Taking the steps three at a time and running, it was almost like going up a regular staircase. But after ascending the second escalator in this manner, he found himself already out of breath. There was no hurry. He would not allow himself to be overtaken by panic, no. He picked up the bag of groceries and books he had left on that landing, waiting for his breath to return, and darted up a third and a fourth flight. While he rested on the landing, he tried to count the steps between floors, but his count differed depending on whether he counted with the current or against it, down or up. The average was roughly 18 steps, and the steps appeared to be 8 or 9 inches deep. Each flight was therefore about 12 feet. It was at least one-third of a mile as the plum drops to Underwood's main floor. He ate, and he rested. Sleeping, he dreamed he was falling down a bottomless pit... Waking, he discovered nothing had changed except the dull ache in his legs, which had become a sharp pain. Overhead, a single strip of fluorescent lighting snaked down the stairwell. The mechanical purr of the escalator seemed to have heightened to the roar of a Niagara, and their rate of descent seemed to have increased proportionately. Fever, he decided, and he stood up stiffly and flexed some of the soreness from his muscles. Halfway up the third escalator, his legs gave way under him. He attempted to climb again and succeeded. He collapsed again on the next flight. 
Lying on the landing where the escalator had deposited him, he realized that his hunger had returned. He also needed to have water. He remembered the water fountain he had drunk from yesterday, and he found another three floors below. It's so much easier going down. His groceries were down there. To go after them now, he would erase whatever progress he had made in his ascent. Perhaps Underwood's main floor was only a few more flights up. Or a hundred. There was no way to know. Because he was hungry, and because he was tired, and because the futility of mounting endless flights of descending escalators was, as he now considered it, a labor of Sisyphus, he returned, descended, gave in. At first he allowed the escalator to take him along at its own mild pace. But he soon grew impatient of this. He found that the exercise of running down the steps, three at a time, was not so exhausting as running up. It was refreshing, almost. And by swimming with the current instead of against it, his progress, if such it can be called, was appreciable. In only minutes, he was back at his cache of groceries. After eating half the fruitcake and a little cheese, he fashioned his coat into a sort of sling for the groceries knotting the sleeves together and then buttoning it closed. With one hand at the collar and the other about the hem, he could carry all his food with him. He looked up the descending staircase with a scornful smile, for he had decided, with the wisdom of failure, to abandon that venture. If the stairs wanted to take him down, then down giddily he would go. Then down he did go. Down, dizzily, down, down. And always it seemed faster, spinning about lightly on his heels at each landing so that there was hardly any break in the wild speed of his descent. Down, ever deeper down. Twice he slipped at the landings, once he missed his footing in a mid-leap on the escalator, hurtled forward, letting go of the sling of groceries and falling, hands stretched out to cushion him onto the steps, which imperturbably continued their descent. He must have been unconscious then, for he woke up in a pile of groceries with a split cheek and a splitting headache. The telescoping steps of the escalator gently grazed his heels. He knew then his first moment of terror. A premonition that there was no end to his descent. But this feeling gave way quickly to a laughing fit. He shouted, I'm going to hell! Though he could not drown with his voice the steady purr of the escalators. This is the way to hell. Abandon hope all ye who enter here. If only I were going to hell, he reflected. If that were the case, it would make sense. Not quite orthodox sense, but some sense. A little Sanity, however, was so integral to his character that neither hysteria nor horror could long have their way with him. He gathered up his groceries again, relieved to find that only the jar of instant coffee had been broken this time. He began a more deliberate descent. He returned to Vanity Fair, reading it as he paced down the down-going steps. He did not let himself consider the extent of the abyss into which he was plunging, and the vicarious excitement of the novel helped him keep his thoughts from his own situation. At page 235, he lunched on the remainder of the cheese and fruitcake. At 523, he rested and dined on the English cookies dipped in peanut butter. If he could regard this absurd dilemma merely as a struggle for survival, another chapter in his own Robinson Crusoe story, he might get to the bottom of this mechanical vortex alive and sane. He thought proudly that many people in his position could not have adjusted. They would have gone mad. Of course, he was descending. But he was still sane. He had chosen his course. Now he was following it. There was no night in the stairwell and scarcely any shadows. He slept when his legs could no longer bear his weight and his eyes were tearful from reading. Sleeping, he dreamed that he was continuing his descent on the escalators. Waking, his hand resting on the rubber railing that moved along at the same rate as the steps, he discovered this to be the case. 
Somnambulistically, he had ridden the escalators further down into this mild, interminable hell, leaving behind his bundle of food and even the still unfinished Thackeray novel. Stumbling up the escalators, he began for the first time to cry. Without the novel, there was nothing to think of but this, this. His legs, which had only been slightly wearied by his descent, gave out 20 flights up. His spirit gave out soon after. Again, he turned around, allowed himself to be swept up by the current, or, more exactly, swept down. The escalator seemed to be traveling more rapidly now, the pitch of the steps to be more pronounced, but he no longer trusted the evidence of his senses. Continuing his descent, he occupied himself with a closer analysis of his environment, not undertaken with any hope of bettering his condition, but only for lack of other diversions. The walls and ceilings were hard, smooth, and off-white. The escalator steps were a dull nickel color, the treads being somewhat shinier, the crevices darker. Did that mean that the treads were polished from use? Or were they designed in that fashion? The treads were half an inch wide and spaced apart from each other by the same width. They projected slightly over the edge of each step, resembling somewhat the head of a barber's shears. Whenever he stopped at a landing, his attention would become fixed on the illusory disappearance of the steps as they sank flush to the floor and then slid tread and groove into the grilled base plate. Less and less would he run or even walk down the stairs, content merely to ride his chosen step from top to bottom of each flight, and at the landing, step onto the escalator that would transport him to the floor below. The stairwell now had tunneled by his calculations miles beneath the department store. So many miles that he began to congratulate himself on his unsought adventure, wondering if he had established some sort of record. In the days that followed, when his only nourishment was the water from the fountains provided at every tenth landing, he thought frequently of food, preparing imaginary meals from the store of groceries he'd left behind. Savoring the ideal sweetness of the honey, the richness of the soup which he would prepare by soaking the powder in the emptied cookie tin, licking the film of gelatin lining the open can of corned beef. When he thought of the six cans of tuna fish, his anxiety became intolerable, for he had no way to open them. Merely to stamp on them would not be enough. What then? He turned the question over and over in his head. Then a curious thing happened. He quickened again the speed of his descent, faster now than when first he had done this, eagerly, headlong, absolutely heedless. The several landings seemed to flash by like a montage of flight, each scarcely perceived before the next was before him. A demonic, pointless race. And why? He was running, so he thought, toward his store of groceries, either believing that they had been left below or thinking that he was running up. Clearly, he was delirious. It did not last. His weakened body could not maintain the frantic pace, and he awoke from his delirium confused and utterly spent. Now began another, more rational delirium, a madness fired by logic. Lying on the landing, rubbing a torn muscle in his ankle, he speculated on the nature, origin, and purpose of the escalators. Reasoned thought was of no more use to him, however, than unreasoning action. Ingenuity was helpless to solve a riddle that had no answer, which was its own reason, self-contained and whole. He, not the escalators, needed an answer. Perhaps his most interesting theory was the notion that these escalators were a kind of exercise wheel like those found in a squirrel cage, from which, because it was a closed system, there could be no escape. Now, this theory required some minor alterations in his conception of the physical universe, which had always appeared highly Euclidean to him before, a universe in which his descent seemingly along a plumb line was, in fact, describing a loop. This theory cheered him, for he might hope, coming full circle, to return to his store of groceries again, if not to Underwood's. 
Perhaps in his abstracted state, he had passed one or the other already several times without observing. Theories, he thought. I don't need theories. I must get on with it. And so, favoring his good leg, he continued his descent, although his speculations did not immediately cease. They became, if anything, more metaphysical. They became vague. Eventually, he could regard the escalators as being entirely matter-of-fact, requiring no more explanation than by their sheer existence they offered him. He discovered that he was losing weight. Being so long without food, by the evidence of his beard, he estimated that more than a week had gone by. This was only to be expected. Yet there was another possibility that he could not exclude, that he was approaching the center of the earth, whereas he understood all things were weightless. Now that, he thought, is something worth striving for. He had discovered a goal. On the other hand, he was dying, a process he did not give all the attention it deserved. Unwilling to admit this eventuality, and yet not so foolish as to admit any other, he sidestepped the issue by pretending to hope. Maybe someone will rescue me, he hoped. But his hope was as mechanical as the escalators he rode, intended, in much the same way, to sink. From the bottom, which he conceived of as the center of the earth, there would be literally nowhere to go but up. Probably another chain of escalators, ascending escalators, but preferably by an elevator. It was important to believe in a bottom. Thought was becoming as difficult, as demanding, as painful as once his struggle to ascend had been. His perceptions were fuzzy. He did not know what was real and what was imaginary. He thought he was eating and discovered that he was gnawing at his hands. He thought he had come to the bottom. It was a large, high-ceilinged room. Signs pointed to another escalator, ascending. But there was a chain across it and a small typed announcement that read, Out of order. Please bear with us while the escalators are being repaired. Thank you, the management. He laughed weakly. He devised a way to open the tuna fish cans. He would slip the can sideways beneath the projecting treads of the escalator, just at the point where the steps were sinking flush to the floor. Either the escalator would split the can open or the can would jam the escalator. Perhaps if one escalator would jam, the whole chain of them would stop. He should have thought of that before, but he was nevertheless quite pleased to have thought of it at all. His body seemed to weigh so little now. He must have come hundreds of miles, thousands. Again, he descended. Then... He was lying at the foot of the escalator. His head rested on the cold metal of the base plate, and he was looking at his hand, the fingers of which were pressed into the creviced grill. One after another, in perfect order, the steps of the escalator slipped into these crevices, tread and groove, rasping at his fingertips, occasionally tearing away a sliver of his flesh. That was the last thing he remembered. This time is titled Descending from a book by Thomas M. Dish called Fun with Your New Head. This is Michael Hansen speaking, engineering by Steve Gordon. Mind Webs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.
right, Nene. We've got you and your mob completely surrounded. Are you coming out peacefully, or do we have to blast you out? For an answer, Captain Murphy of the 63rd Precinct received a withering flame of machine gun fire from a second-story window. His police squad ducked behind bulletproof cars and armored cycles. With swift movements of shuffling feet, Professor Cosmo Jones sidled up to Murphy. Uh, pardon me, Captain, but may I suggest that I be allowed to intercede? The big policeman turned around and his face twisted in a mixed picture of surprise and rage. So, it's you again, Cosmo Jones, you little mouse. Now listen, will you go home and crawl under the bed before you get hurt? These guys are killers. He turned toward the police car's microphone. All right, mate. Let them have it. And that's the dramatic opening to another story from Studio X, starring America's most versatile actor, Mr. Paul Freese, who will return after a few profitable moments with your announcer. And here is your star of Studio X, Mr. Paul Freese. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Studio X and our presentation of... The Professor Goes for a Walk. During a slight lull in the firing, Professor Cosmo Jones took advantage of another opportunity to approach the police captain and tugged at his sleeve. Uh, if you please, Captain Murphy, I have a very good suggestion as to how... Listen... Didn't I tell you to get back out of here? Murphy turned back to his men. Cosmo reached up and tapped him on the shoulder. Uh, I'm quite sure that if you'll just listen... The captain went livid with rage and choked up. And from then on, the police did everything to get Cosmo out of the way. They pushed him around. They jostled him aside. Meanwhile, the battle carried on with Murphy directing hostilities toward the hoodlum hideout and shaking himself free from the professor who constantly tugged at his coat. Finally, it was the little fellow himself who gave up in disgust. Grasping his walking stick and umbrella firmly in one hand, he calmly walked out right in the center of no man's land. Standing there in the white beams of police searchlights, he was a perfect target for gunfire from either side. Captain Murphy nearly had a heart attack as he screamed into the microphone. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! Beads of sweat oozed out of his forehead as he addressed the professor. Get, get out of here, you little dope. Come over here before you get a bullet in the pants. Come on, hurry up. But Cosmo had made up his mind to take a different course of action. He approached the opposite curb, threw back his head and called up to the second story window. Uh, gentlemen, I should like to have a talk with you. I'm sure you won't mind if I come upstairs. There was no firing, no response from the window. Without a moment's hesitation, the professor entered the building and proceeded up the stairs. At the top of the landing, he knocked on the wooden panel and waited until the door was jerked open. He boldly stepped across the threshold under the guidance of two men bristling with guns. There were two other men inside, and the room looked like a small arsenal. The shades were ripped away from the glass-shattered windows, tables and chairs were overturned and the place was in a thorough state of shambles. The only light in the room came from the searching ribbons of police lights and the bright glow of street lamps on the outside. The professor stood there meekly until the man who seemed to be Donnelly, the leader, spoke. What you got on your mind, screwball? Cosmo stood perfectly quiet as he answered. Uh, well, gentlemen, to be perfectly frank with you, I... I I was thinking that you might save yourselves a lot of trouble by raising a flag of truce, laying down your arms, and submitting peacefully to the officers of the law. A tough-looking individual with a scar that ran from his temple to the corner of his mouth barked at Donnelly. What is this guy? Nuts? The professor was quick to give assurance. Oh, oh, oh no, gentlemen. I, I can set your minds at ease by saying that I'm not the victim of dementia praecox. Definitely not. Scarface barked again. Hey, listen to the guy. 
He's swearing at us. Benelli spat out a command. Shut up, Augie. Then he waved a gun at the professor. What are you? A copper? Oh, no. Heavens, no. I'm not a minion of the law. I'm a doctor of science. The leader bobbed his head at the gang. Meet the doc, you monkeys. A guy who don't know when he's well off by keeping his bugle out of the guy's business. Well, now, you get this, Flappy Ears. We don't go for your ideas. And because I ain't got no time to waste, I'm going to polish you off. Uh, 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 you mean you're going to shoot me? Yeah, that's the general idea. The professor answered without a tremor in his voice. Oh, but uh, I, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Hey, <laughs> this guy's really screwy. I, I, I resent that statement intensely. I gave you my assurance once before that I'm not mentally maladjusted. As a matter of fact, I might venture to say that it is you gentlemen who are displaying symptoms of mental derangement. If you abolish me homicidally. Donnelly became impatient. Cut out the fancy talk. Speak English. Well, you see, gentlemen, between the thumb and index finger of my right hand, I hold a small capsule. You remember I told you I was a doctor of science? Well, in this capsule, I have a highly concentrative and potent formula that when subjected to a slight concussion, will explode. There's no noise at all, just a heavy film of gas that pervades the room. And when the victim, or I might say, uh, victims, breathe this gas, it desensitizes them for a period of several hours. The who's a, is a, what is he saying? Cosmo quietly explained in detail what he'd just said. Donnelly put his hand to his belt line. How long does it take for a guy to croak? Oh, he doesn't die for a good many days. Sometimes it takes several weeks. A victim experiences electrostatic pains for a long period of time. Donnelly took a step forward. Let me say this thing. Send back. Stay where you are or I might drop it. The gangster stopped in his tracks as the little man continued. Uh, and now, gentlemen, perhaps you'll listen to me reasonably, hmm? As I was coming upstairs, I took the precaution to take an antidote. You understand? Another capsule to offset personal harm to myself in the event that it is necessary for me to drop the little article that I hold in my hand. So, now that everything has been explained and it is obvious that I'm the master of the situation, I want you to follow my suggestion. Wave a flag of truce out of the window to testify that you are going to surrender peacefully. Then toss all this uh, artillery that you've gathered around the room into the street below. Walk downstairs and submit to the police officers quietly. The professor waited for a moment and received no answer. Come, 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 gentlemen. Uh, there's no time to lose. After all, what would you be gaining by holding out? Hmm? Sooner or later, the police will storm your not invulnerable fort. Blood will shed your blood and all for nothing. There was a long pause and nothing was said. Gentlemen, I shall now drop the little pellet I hold in my hand. It was Scarface who revealed his thoughts. Wait a minute. Listen, Donnelly. I ain't gonna take a rap for no little monkey like that. I'm waving my nosegay out of the window right now. He took his handkerchief and started for the window. The other two men followed. Donnelly looked disgustedly at the professor. All right, all right, we're stuck. But if you didn't have that little pill in your mitts, I'd blast you. It was an amazed Captain Murphy who watched while the white ribbon of surrender flooded about at the second-story window. And then a rain of pistols, revolvers, ammunition, rifles, and sawed-off shotguns descended to the sidewalk. Police officers, with their mouths open, saw the unbelievable sight of a gang of the worst cutthroats in the city meekly step out on the sidewalk with their hands high above their heads. Murphy barked orders to his fellow officers and then spoke briefly with Dinelli. An instant later, the hoodlums were packed into police squad cars and driven away. The captain waited until Professor Jones reached the pavement and then hailed him. Hey, you little worm. Come here. What's the meaning of this? You practically commit suicide and then a stunt like this comes off. What's the angle? 
The little fellow smiled modestly and started off on his favorite subject. You see, Captain, my theory that there is no need for violence in apprehending criminals was upheld again by the practical application of pretense and events of misleading character. I might say that if you ever have need for my services in the future, you can reach me by dropping a card to Professor Cosmo Jones in care of general delivery. No, don't give me any more of your blarney. Donnelly told me you had a bomb in your hands up there. The professor looked puzzled. Uh, a, a, a bomb? Yes. Yes, now I'll hold you your little worm. Where, where, where is it? Come out with it now. Cosmo thought a moment, and then a dawning light spread over his face. Oh. Oh, yes, yes. You mean this? The captain looked down at the pellet in the little fellow's hand. Yes, I, I guess so. What is it? Why? It's merely a capsule of concentrated cod liver oil containing vitamins A, B, and D to say nothing of that modern vitamin B12. Have one, Captain. And so ends another story from Studio X, starring your one-man theater, Paul Fries, who portrays all of the parts. Mr. Fries will return in just a moment after a few words from your announcer. The Professor Goes for a Walk was written by Walter Gehring, produced by Sam Kerner with music composed and played by Rami Idris. Special effects by Fred Cole. Your announcer was Shepard Mencken. Won't you join us again at Studio X when we present another thrilling story for your entertainment? This is Paul Fries saying goodbye. Until next, we meet. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Laurie, presented by Camel Cigarettes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you will inspect the 47 wax images you see before you, I think you will admit that they are more lifelike more startlingly real than any you have ever seen before. But the greatest interest lies in the fact that each one of these figures is a fiendish, sadistic murderer. Uh, but come, I begin at the end of the line and describe their horrible crime. Yes, yes, there he goes, there he goes again, telling people all the bad things with it. Oh, it's terrible, being nothing but figures in a wax museum. People staring at us all day long, and not one of them, not one ever suspects that we are still alive. Each week at this time, Camel Cigarettes bring you Peter Lorre in the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Mask of Medusa by Nelson Bond. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre. 
Brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. When you smoke a cigarette, it's your T-zone that passes judgment on it. Yes, your T-zone, that's T for taste and T for throat, is your proving ground for any cigarette. If your taste longs for really full, rich flavor in a cigarette, if your throat would welcome true coolness and mildness in a cigarette, don't miss trying a camel. You may well find, like so many millions of smokers, that camels suit your tea zone to a tea. So, Greta, how do you like this little fellow, huh? Oh, he's nice, Carl. I don't believe he ever did anything wrong. <laughs> ah, you women, always the same. You heard the lecture say that every one of these figures is the likeness of a real murder. Mm. <laughs> Maybe this little angel poisoned his wife, eh? <laughs> I don't believe it. He is too innocent looking. Well, they always are. <laughs> Except his eyes. They go right through me. Come on, oh, every report. idiots, idiots and morons. Can't they see I'm still... No, I suppose not. But I'd like to be alive again. Oh, alive again. I'm alive right now, but I'd be better off dead. I can hear, I can see, I can feel, I can think. But I cannot move. I, I cannot move at all. No matter how and now, I ladies try. and gentlemen, if you will regard these recent specimens, and if I may say so myself, they're masterpieces. <laughs> What's the matter, madam? That strange-looking little one. I was watching him, and he moved his eyes. Thank you, madam. That's a true compliment to my artistry. But I assure you, the gentleman did not move his eyes. Dirty that would liar. be utterly impossible. He is made of wax and other substances known only to myself. Rubbish. I'm English, my man, and you can't bamboozle me. I'm sorry if the realism of my exhibits has played tricks with your imagination. Imagination fiddlesticks. I tell you, if you doubt that my exhibit is exactly as represented, madam, may I return your price of admission? Oh. Here you are. Oh. Oh, well, thank you so much. Now, perhaps if I might suggest a little fresh air. Well, I I, I do feel a bit faint. (laughs) All these ghastly crimes, you know. Of course. I believe I'll go and have a cup of tea. (laughs) To resume, ladies and gentlemen, if you will step over this way, this way, please, you will see exhibit number three, the infamous hatchet woman of... This way, this way, exhibit three. Just listen to him. Day in, day out, we stand here while he talks and talks and talks about us. Oh, he's so boring. All he talks about are those silly incidental murders we committed. Why doesn't he talk how we did them, huh? For he and this room are some of the greatest artists in their lines the world has ever known. For example, just look at the ones on each side of me. Here to my left. That's Paul, yes, Owen. He was the most skillful man with a scalpel in Prague. He was wonderful. Even today, they haven't found all the pieces of the bodies he carved up now. And, and on my right is the beautiful, beautiful Magda. She always killed with a luger. She used but one bullet to her husband, and she did away with five of them. Yes, indeed, it's, it's an honor to stand between such exquisite artists. And as for me, I can hardly believe it was only three days ago that I... That I came in here of my own free will. My own free will. I... Good evening, sir. Uh, uh, good evening. You wish to see my wax figures? Huh? Wax figures? Yes. Well, all around you. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes, of course, and... You mean to see... You mean you mean all these people are wax? But certainly. You know, you know, for a moment, I, I thought they were alive. A very natural mistake. It is, huh? Well, did you... By the way, is anything the matter? You I'm seem nervous. I'm not What's nervous. What's the matter with you? D- d- didn't you hear me? I don't know. That's ugly sound. What is that?
Yes, it's gone. I don't like it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I'm late. I'm sure you want to close up. I'll I'll go now. Perhaps some other oh, time I'll be back. Oh, it is never and... too late to show my masterpieces. Huh? Uh, but first, I'll lock the door and draw the shades. Wait. There. Now then, you don't have to be afraid of being seen. Afraid? Why should I be afraid, huh? I don't know. Why should anyone be afraid? I don't know. Well, I'm in no hurry. Well, I suppose since I'm here, I, I might as well... Look over my collection? Yes, why not? Good. Uh, permit me to introduce myself. I am Aristide Zweig, owner of this exhibit, artist and connoisseur of crime. <laughs> artist and connoisseur of crime. <laughs> That's an odd combination. Not at all, as you shall see. Uh, mm -hmm. Suppose we begin here. Uh, do you, by any chance, recognize this one? This one? No. But he's very ugly. Roger Saunders, Englishman, oh. a poisoner, not very imaginative. Oh. Uh, next to him here is Nicholas Rodriguez. See, well, he killed with the knife. Wait a minute. And over here... What's the matter? Tell me, these people, they, they all have a strange look. Strange? Yes, oh. it's, it's as if... It, as if they had just seen something horrible and... And then their faces <laughs> froze. And they... uh, perhaps they did see something. Something that made them realize the horror of their crimes. The crimes? Are, are, are these all criminals? Every one. All 46 of them. Murderers. Hmm. You must be very interested in murder to get up a collection like this. Oh, but I am. It is my mission. Oh, your mission. What are you talking about? Murder. Murder, that most horrible of crimes. Yes. I hate it. I loathe and despise its perpetrators. It is my mission to show the world these fiends in human form, to display them in all their brutal bestiality, yes. that men may view them, tremble, and take heed. I see, I see. And yes. Oh, where do you get your specimen? From the morgue? Not from the moor. No. I get them here, there, wherever I can find them. Oh, no, Usually no. I have to go out and look for them. As a matter of fact, there is one now I would like to have very much oh, yeah. for my 47 specimen. Oh. Yes, he murdered a defenseless old woman quite near here, not half an hour ago it was. I heard it over my radio. Yeah, he yeah. brutally murdered her and took her life savings. Yes, yeah. Did they catch him? Mm, not yet. But they will. Yes. They're watching all the roads. And besides that, the old woman's money was in old bills. Oh, right. So old, it is now out of circulation. Mm -hmm. When he tries to pass it, they will know. And if they don't catch him, I will. You will. You, yes. huh? Yes, yes. Murder must be avenged and exposed by one means or another. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Forgive me for going on like this. Oh, Sometimes I get carried away. Let's get back to this next figure. A most interesting case. This man, Hans Schneider, well, who murdered by air embolism. You say yes. Schneider? Hans Schneider? Yes. Look, I knew him. He disappeared. He was never captured. He wasn't even suspected. None of them were. How, how did you get them here? I told you, sir, I am an artist. I have my own methods of reproducing their likenesses. Wait, wait a minute. Tell me... Is that a model of Schneider, or, or is that Schneider himself? Uh, how in the world did you happen to guess? You're uh, quite correct. It is Schneider. But this is monstrous. Not at all. You just do not understand. Yes, I do. I understand you. You dirty hypocrite. You, you say you hate murder, and yet you've killed everyone in this room, you... No, I didn't kill them. How did you do it, huh? Poison, knife, or, or did you dip them into boiling wax alive? None of those things. They're not dead. They're not dead, huh? What did you say? They're not dead. They're simply in a state of permanent suspended animation. Suspended animation? Are you mad? Are you insane? It's true. I just let them look, and that's what happened. Let them look at what? Did you ever hear of the Gorgon's head? What? The head of Medusa. Medusa, yes, of course. I, I went to school, and I studied Greek mythology. Of course, Medusa was a... She was a very beautiful woman, yes. and, and she offended Athena, and, and Athena changed her hair into snakes and made her face uh, very hideous and so horrible that all who looked on her were turned to stone. And, and later, I, I think, uh, Perseus cut off her head. You're and, right. And yeah. the severed head could still turn men to stone. Yes, yes, I know, but <laughs> that was a long time ago. Would you care to look upon it? What are you talking about? Oh, it's here. The mask of Medusa was found long ago in a wild lost grotto in Greece. 
Where and how does not matter. But it has been the means of fulfilling my sacred mission. The destruction, the cleansing of the world of those who slay their fellow men. Now I know you're mad. <laughs> Perhaps I am the only sane one in a world gone mad. Oh, sure, sure. Tell me, sir, this, uh, this mask, what, what does it look like? Oh, I have never seen it myself. The native who gave it to me warned me. I do not dare look. Oh, no, no, I don't <laughs> blame you. I, I don't blame you at all. She... Listen, suppose, Mr. Twag, we talk a little business, you and me, huh? What do you want? I want your help to get me out of town. How can I help you? Well, that's very simple. Nobody suspects you that, uh, that is, uh, nobody but me. You put me in a crate like one of these 46 models you are so proud of and send it off in a truck. Simple, huh? But why? Why should I do this? Why? Because you fear the police as much as I do. You fear the police? You are a murderer? I didn't say that. You are a murderer. No more than you are. But I didn't kill them. I told you I didn't kill them. Yes, yes, you told me. It's a fine story, but who is going to believe it? Police? Yes, no, sir, no. If the police come here, and I'll make sure that they come here. It would take money. Money, my... Here is money, all the money you need. Uh, I talk ah, I thought so. Why? That money, those old bills. So it was you. You were the one who murdered the old woman and took her savings. I thought oh, so all along. Yes, I thought stupid so. stupid woman, if she hadn't resisted wait, me, Wait, she... wait, I have something in this cabinet I want to show you. Look, look, look. no tricks. You hear me or the police comes in it. Hey, what's I in didn't that want sack? to do this. I what never want to sack? do it, but it must be done. You don't want to do what? Look, murderer, you upon the crimson what mask are you of Medusa. About, you yes, look, out. look upon the Someone. mask of oh, Medusa. My, my legs. Look. It's my, look. My hands. Are... Look. Uh, now, I have number 47. In a few moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present Act Two of The Mask of Medusa. It's been proved time and time again in work, in sports, in everything we do. Experience is the best teacher. Ace Midget Auto Racer, Walter Ader, proved it conclusively when two other cars crashed and almost blocked the track during a recent championship race. Roaring up at 100 miles an hour, Walter Ader squeaked through an opening only inches wider than his car. Mr. Ader said, Experience is the best teacher. In choosing cigarettes as well as in auto racing. I've smoked most all the brands. Camels suit me best. Yes, experience is the best teacher. Smokers learned how true that is during the wartime cigarette shortage. Smoking so many different brands when there was no choice made folks experts on judging the differences in cigarette quality. Well, that proved to thousands and thousands of smokers that there's nothing like Camel's rich, full flavor. Nothing like Camel's cool mildness. Result? More people are smoking Camel's than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a Camel yourself. Now a new crowd is viewing the attractions of Aristide Swag's Wax Museum. The lifelike, living but not breathing, images of the 47 murderers. Oh, come, Hilda. Let's go outside. I don't like this place. Wait, here's one we didn't see. I don't know how you can stand there looking at them. The murderers. And their faces. <laughs> this little one isn't so bad. If he was alive, I could go for him. No, no, he's horrible. <laughs> Come on, I can't. Stand oh, him. I could crush her skull. Stupid idiots. No, it, it is not pleasant to be stared at day after day by people who know nothing of life or death, at least not, not as we know it. The living dead, yes, that's what we are, and he, he is responsible. Oh, if we could only somehow somehow get back to normal, even for a little bit. Oh, 
What we could do, all of us. What we could do. Now it's midnight. It's very still, but something, something odd is happening. Just a little while ago, my, my mind was blank. I, I wasn't thinking about anything, but, but suddenly a thought came into my head. Yes, and suddenly, out of nowhere. Yes, we there, can protect our There it is again. If we try. Who? Who is what? Magda, standing next to you. Yes? Think, think hard. Yeah. If we all think together... Perhaps we can make somebody help us. Yes. Yes, of course. Oh, oh that's wonderful, Magda. Think hard. She's wonderful, of course. Forty-seven minds trained in crime, all concentrating at once on somebody who comes in here to look. <laughs> if we try, if we try hard enough, we could make him do anything. Maybe we could get him to... No, oh, that's too much to expect, but, but still. It... Yes, another day has started, but today I have a feeling of excitement. All night long, all night long, we concentrated, and, and our thoughts were getting stronger and stronger. I'm convinced Magda has gotten through to everyone. I have a feeling that something is going to happen, and, and just a little while ago, there came a thought... Mike is upstairs in his room. Yeah? We must watch the door. The door. When the right one comes, mm -hmm. we shall know it at once. Be ready. I'm ready. Whatever is going to happen, I'm ready. There, there, the door is open. Maybe this is it. Father, I'm frightened. I do not wish to look. It won't hurt you, Ilsa. Teach mm -hmm. you maybe to get over your stupid fears. I should look at these figures, every one of them. Do you understand? Yes, Father. Now, where is that lecturer? He should be here. Now, I will find him so that he can tell you all about these criminals. <laughs> think. Think hard. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there's no doubt of it. It's this little, little Ilse. Oh, she's the one, yes. She's the one we've been waiting for. She's the kind of mind we need, yes. Oh, how exciting. How exciting. Thoughts are coming in very strong. Keep, keep thinking, Magda. We can't be free unless something happens to that horrible mask of Medusa over there on that cabinet. If something could happen to that, the spell might be broken. Magda, what are you thinking? Matches and fire. Matches and fire. Yes, sir. Matches I've got it. Of course I've got it, yes. Matches and fire. Matches and fire. Father. Matches and fire. Father, where are you? Matches and fire. I, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, have you seen my daughter? She was here a minute ago. A, a thin girl, about 16. I have not Man. seen her. I saw her just now over there with that cabinet, I think it was. She had a box of matches in her hand. <laughs> it's worked. All our trained evil minds concentrating on that one small mind. Oh, we simply overwhelmed it. Poor little Ilse, she'll never know why she started that fire. Oh, but but it's a big, wonderful fire, and, and the cabinet is burning. It's it's burning. And, uh, what is that? I, oh, I, uh, something is happening. I I've just been able to move the little finger in my in my left hand. Yes, yes, we we can move. <laughs> Yes, we are free. We can move, all of us. 
We are moving. We, the walking dead. Everyone, everyone is moving swiftly through the flames. Oh, they can't hurt us. Towards the stairs, yes. Oh, we are a horrible company. Oh, how exciting. White faces, clean. The flames, 40, 47 we are. Murderous, all of us. Surging forward to get the man. The man we hate. Oh, yes, he's a murderer. But he's worse than we are. His victims stay alive. He condemned all 47 of us to a horrible, endless, living death. <laughs> He's behind that door. It's locked. Come on, break it down. Break it down, you hear? Come on. Yes. Yes, Yes, we've got him. What have you done to him? (laughs) What have we done? We've taken care of you, Medusa. Yes, we have, Aristide. And now, now we'll take care of you. No, please. Don't. I will help you. You don't know the mask, you fools. I'll help you. You haven't got much time. Help you. I'll help you. The mask is coming. It's coming up the stairs. Careful. Kill us. Kill Swahik. At least we can kill Swahik. Wait, wait, wait. I have a plan. Get away from that door. Let me get there. If it's here, close Don't. your eyes. Look. Don't look at it. Too late. They looked. And now they're all gone. All but you and I. Yes. Everybody's gone back as they were before. Yes, they're gone. All gone but you and I. You and I. What are you going to do? I'll show you what I'm going to do. Here. Look, Aristide. What? Look here. What? You hear me? No. Yes, yes, no. sir. No. Oh. No. You no. opened your eyes. No, I Yes, can't. you saw it. No. Look at you're looking at the crimson mask of Medusa. You, oh, look, look. Your feet. Oh, well, I know it. Look at your legs, your hands. Oh, you can. You're not even able to talk anymore. Yes, you. Now you have looked upon the mask of Medusa. You idiot, you. I, I, I forgot her. I looked at it, too. <sighs> Well, well, well. Here we are, back again, yes, all of us. The finest criminal minds in the world. Oh, it's the elite, the cream of crime. Now we are just wax figures in a sideshow. Yes, but now, now there are 48 of us. (laughs) Oh, I suppose uh, we should feel honored to have with us the great Aristide Zweig. This way he looks quite natural, yes. Standing over there between Schneider and Paul. And at least he doesn't bore me anymore with his silly, stupid lectures. No. Now he doesn't talk at all. Someone called Albert is running the exhibit now. Oh, poor Albert. He's an imbecile. Albert doesn't know there was a mask of Medusa. Oh, we are much more intelligent than poor Albert. He, he doesn't even know that we are, that we are still alive. <laughs> Each week, the makers of Camel cigarettes send free camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Sun Mount, New York, USAAF Station Hospital, Kessler Field, Biloxi, Mississippi, U.S. Naval Hospital, Corona, California, U.S. Marine Hospital, Mobile, Alabama, and Veterans Hospital, Knoxville, Iowa. Three leading independent research organizations made a survey of doctors' cigarette preferences. 113,597 doctors were asked 
What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you an exciting story of gambling and sudden death. The Immortal Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Try Prince Albert in your pipe, and you'll know why more pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco. Men like P.A. because it's specially made for smoking pleasure. Extra rich and full-flavored. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. And specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Just try a pipe full of Prince Albert. See if you don't get more enjoyment from the National Joy Smoke. And folks, be sure to listen to Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry Saturday night for a half hour of folk songs, fun and laughter with your favorite folk stars, Red Foley, Minnie Pearl, Rod Brassfield, and the rest of the Opry gang. And his Red special guest, Jimmy Wakely. Remember, Prince Albert's Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night over NBC. Yes, your dream can come true. Your own home, a college education for your son. Travel. Save for them and they'll be yours. Buy U.S. savings bonds. Buy them regularly. U.S. savings bonds are always safe, always profitable. Sign up for the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond a month plan where you bank. Listen again next week at the same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Laurie in Mystery in the Air. The artists supporting Mr. Laurie tonight were Henry Morgan, Peggy Weber, Lucille Meredith, Stanley Waxman, Russell Thorson, Ben Wright, and Phyllis Christine Morris. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camels. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. go through a horrible experience that seemed very real. Yes, sometimes reality and unreality seem as one and you're not so sure anymore that the fellow tonight in a mystery playhouse. about somebody else, which is almost as bad. This gentleman had a particularly realistic one. In fact, he didn't know for the life of him whether or not it really happened. But you listen for yourself to the unfolding of William Irish's strange and intriguing story of a, of a man who dreamed he committed murder and, and woke up to the fact that maybe he actually had... Listen to Nightmare. Dodge, Homicide Division. Clip, this is Vince. Ah, oh, hello, kid. What's on your mind? Clip, Clip, I've got to see you now, as soon as possible. Uh, look, kid, I'm working. What's so important? You can't tell it on the phone. Cliff, I think I 
killed a man last night. I don't know whether I dreamed it or it actually happened. That's why I've got to see you. You killed somebody? I can't believe it. Not you, Vince. Listen, meet me in the office in 15 minutes. Whatever you do, don't tell anybody else about this. Go ahead, Vince. Tell me some more about this dream of yours. Well, after that, Cliff, all I remember is the white face. The face of a woman. Beautiful, but, but false somehow. You see, we were in a room with nothing but doors. Eight doors, frame to frame, with no wall space between. Well, I I opened one of the doors, and suddenly someone rushed at me. We struggled, and he forced me to the floor. As we fought, he said to the woman, hand me that knife. Well, I raised my hand to defend myself, and suddenly I felt the handle of something. I realized the woman had put the knife into my hand by mistake. And then I... Then you stabbed him. Yeah. Then I stabbed him. Well... After that, the woman disappeared, and I felt I had to hide the body. Well, behind one of the eight doors, there was a closet. I propped the body inside, and I locked the door. Then I went out of the house. That's horrible. I can't get it out of my mind. But what makes you think any of this actually happened? It's an unpleasant dream, sure, but it's not unusual. Lots of people dream they kill someone. But when you dream, do you wake up with big scratches on your wrist like this one? What are you asking me to believe? You got up in your sleep and you killed somebody? Scratch on your wrist proves nothing. I admit that, but... Then when I got out of bed this morning, I... Here, I found this button. Now, wait a minute. You're not going to tell me that button came off in your hand while you were wrestling with that guy in the dream. That's the way it happened. That I refuse to believe. It came off your shirt. I could never afford pearl buttons. You know that. Not real pearl. Now, listen to me, Vince. I don't want to hear any more of this. If I weren't your brother-in-law, I'd lock you up and call a psychiatrist. How do you think all this makes me feel? Cliff, it w- if it wasn't for the key, I could forget the whole thing. Key? Key? What key? I suppose it's something else from your dream. Now, stop it, Vince. I don't want to hear any more. That's right. Go ahead. Get sore. But no matter how angry you get, it doesn't destroy the reality of this key. Look at it. You never see a key like this these days. It's fretted. It's full of scroll work made of brass, old-fashioned, but nevertheless real. And in the dream, if it was a dream, that's the key I used to lock the body in the closet. What's there left to think only this, there's somewhere, somewhere there's a door that this, this key belongs to. And behind that door, there's a dead man, and I don't know where. My Lord, I don't know where. Or who he is, nor how and why it happened. Now, look, kid. It's just one of those cockeyed dreams that happen to people, that's all. But if it'll make you feel any better, you can go in the teletype room and watch the reports, Vince. Every crime committed in this state is reported on those machines. Maybe you can identify yourself with some criminal and get this thing off your chest... I'll join you later. Haven't you given up yet? Don't be funny, Cliff. There's one here that's possible. A stabbing in a town called Clarksburg. Clarksburg? Yeah. There's no transportation up there. You never did learn how to drive a car. You'd really need supernatural aid to kill somebody up there. Now, wait a minute, Cliff. Here's some more coming in on that stabbing in Clarksburg. It's a description. Ah. Killer, five feet nine, weight 150, brown hair, wearing a yellow and green sweater under a brown suit. Hey, Vince, you wear a yellow and green sweater, don't you? Don't be coy. You gave me that sweater for Christmas. Maybe it's only a coincidence, but you're about five feet nine... Weigh about 150? Ah, that couldn't possibly have been you, Vince. Who are you talking for, yourself? I know I found that key and the button in the pocket of my brown suit. You're not kidding anybody. You want to know just as much as I do. Come on, let's get started for Clarksburg. Lousy rain. Must be a cloud burst. I can't see a thing. This windshield wiper's broken. Cliff, do you know where we are? We've been lost for the past five minutes. I don't even remember how we got on this road. Well, I'm going to roll down the window. Getting wet's better than crashing into something. Hey, Cliff. Yeah? Take the next road to the left. That'll get us to Clarksburg. How do you know it'll get us to Clarksburg? I thought you said you'd never been out this way before. Well, I... 
I don't know how I know. All of a sudden, everything looks familiar to me, as if I'd been over this same road before. I just know you've got to turn left at the next road. Stop here, Cliff. Stop here. Hey, what's the big idea? You're trying to kill somebody, grabbing the brake that way? That house, Cliff. There with the big porch. That's the house with the eight-room door. How do you know that's the house? But you said you'd never been out here before. I've never been here before in my life. Unless... Unless it happened in your dream, is that it? Well, I think this is all crazy. We'll soon know for sure. Come on. We're going in and see whether there's an eight-doored room or not. Funny the front door wasn't locked, Cliff. Never mind that. How do you know the eight-doored room is upstairs? I, I just know, that's all. Cliff, I think it's this room right here. This is it. This is the place, all right. Count them. One, two, three, four, five. Eight doors. Where's that key? It's right here in my pocket. You'll have to get it out. I can't. My hands are all wet. Perspiration. Stop acting like a baby. You're sweating all over. There's the key. Now, which door? That one, I think. <sighs> There's nothing there. Not now, there isn't. But there was something there. What? Look. There's blood on the wall. Oh, Lord. How do you believe me? Now do you understand that I wasn't joking when I told you about my dream? Sure, I believe you. I believe you dreamed you killed somebody and stuffed them in the closet there. I believe you never saw this place before. That you intuitively knew which road to take and which house to come to. What do you take me for, a dope? I wasn't lying to you, Cliff. Honest, I wasn't lying. You came to me for help, didn't you? But you didn't have guts enough to come clean to say, Cliff, I went out to a place last night and killed a guy for such and such a reason. No, you cook up a dream trying to take advantage of me because I'm married to your sister. No, Cliff. Abusing my gullibility because I like you. Making a fool out of me. Cliff, I wasn't lying to you. Everything happened just as I told you it did. How I happen to know this house was here, I don't remember. You've got to believe me. Shut up. The dream's over now and baby's awake. You're going to start all over from scratch, you and me. I'm going to get the facts out of you. Please, Cliff, let go of my shoulder. You're hurting me. What were you doing here last night? I never was here before. I never saw it until I came here with you. Don't lie. Every time you lie, you're going to get something like this. Please, Cliff, I'm half crazy already without you beating me Who up. was the guy you did it to? What was his name? I tell you, I don't know. I don't know. Are you going to answer me, Vince? I can't. You're asking me things I can't answer. Who was the guy? Why did you kill him? I've handled close mouth guys before. You're going to tell me if I have to slap it out of you. Right in this spot where you killed somebody else. Cliff, please. Please don't hit me again. What was that? It sounded like a door slam. Then there's somebody else in this house. Which door did we come in? I don't know. One of the eight. All right, you guys, we've got you covered. Back up against that door there. One false move and I'll drop you. Haven't you found what you're looking for yet? Yeah, I guess I've seen enough. This stuff in your wallet identifies you. Cliff Dodge, Homicide Division. Why didn't you say you're a detective? It's nobody's business. Okay, okay. Wagner's my name. I'm the sheriff around here. When I see people monkeying around the house where a murder's just been committed... Murder? But... You found the body? Yeah. As a matter of fact, there were two murders. A man was killed and stuffed in that closet over there. We found the other body outside. A woman. Wasn't dead when she was found, but she was dying. Run over by a car. Deliberately. The car was run back and forth over her body. She said a few things before she died. Told us all about the other body in the closet. And gave us a pretty good description of the killer. She said the same person murdered the man in the closet and deliberately ran over her body with a car? No, but what else is there to conclude? Eh, poor Mrs. Fleming... 
She owned this house, expected her husband home from South America tonight. She was a flirt, but even so, a very charming woman. You don't happen to have a picture of this woman, this Mrs. Fleming, do you? There's one in the next room. That door behind you. Open the door, Vince. I can't, Cliff, I can't. Open the door. Please, Cliff. Open the door. That's her, that big picture on the left. Pretty, wasn't she? Cliff, that's her. Uh, Well, now what's the matter with him? He's fainted. Can't stand the sight of people who've been murdered, even if it's only a picture. Give me a hand with him, will you? There. Now, do you feel any better, kid? Yeah. Yeah, I feel all right. Cliff. Cliff, that picture, it was the same woman. The woman from the dream. Also, the woman who was run over and over with an automobile. But I can't drive, Cliff. You know I can't drive. Yeah, if it hadn't been for that, I'd have turned you over to Wagoner for murder. Did the sheriff leave? Yeah, he left. But I still don't believe that stuff about a dream. Are you sure you didn't leave something out, some small detail? No, no, no. I told you everything, Cliff. I was tired. I went to bed early. I fell asleep. That is right after Mr. Berg closed my door. Berg? You didn't mention any Mr. Berg before? Well, he moved into our rooming house about a month ago. Why did he come into your room? Well, the lights went on the blink. I remember he was carrying a candle. How was Berg holding that candle? Well, the flame was right in front of his eyes. I I remember staring at it. I, I was very tired, Cliff. I don't remember everything. And Berg, he said you're very tired, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, now that you mention it, he did say that. Good. Now, have you ever seen this picture? No. No, but the, but the man looks familiar. Say, that looks like Berg. I never saw him so well-dressed, but that's Berg, all right. I found this picture in this room. Here? In this room? You, you found Berg's... What are you driving at? Sense, reason, logic, sanity. The man you identify as Berg also happens to be Mr. Fleming, the husband of the woman who was killed last night. Berg is Fleming and Fleming is Berg? Now I'm really going out of my mind. It's simple to a flat foot. I figure that Fleming pretended he went to South America. He took a room in your rooming house under the name of Berg. And tonight he's pretending to return from South America. At least Wagner said he's expected. And last night Fleming came back here and murdered his wife? But, but who killed the other one? The man? You did. But you didn't know you were doing it. Oh, I did kill someone after all. I am a murderer. I still don't understand how it happened. All sir. right, kid, relax. Because we're going to find out tonight. Find out? Right. Now, if Fleming comes home, as his wife expected him to do, you're going to be waiting in this room for him. Waiting with a gun. That won't do any good, Maybe It might after you've learned a few answers. Now, I'm going to tell you exactly what to say to Fleming, word for word. You might not understand, but you're going to memorize the things I tell you to say, word for word. Memorize? Yeah, because your life depends on it. Cliff, you're not going to leave me here alone, are you, Cliff? There'll be nothing I can do to help you, kid. If everything goes right, you'll come out of this scot-free. If anything goes wrong, that's the end. Now, Fleming will probably come up those stairs at the far end of the hall. He had better stand over here. The first thing to remember, let him speak first. How did you get here? You showed me the way, didn't you? You... You remembered coming here? You're lying. Who brought you here? Who came with you? Just this gun. That's impossible. You... You had the look, the typical look. Why did you do everything you were told to do? I wanted to see where it was all leading. I thought there might be some good in it for me later. You... You purposely pretended? You mean you went ahead and consciously killed? I figured you'd pay off heavy afterwards to keep me quiet. I found your wife and her lover just as you said I would. It was easy should have known my control wasn't perfect when I saw my wife come running out of the house. She saw my car, came toward me. I I waited, then gave it the gas. I killed the man, and you killed your wife. You wanted them both dead, didn't you? Yes, yes, but I didn't want to have to kill her myself. I loved her, but... 
But I hated her. She said I was too old for it. That's her. what I wanted to hear. What? That's it. To hear you convict yourself. What, what did you... I was lying to you. Your control was perfect. You hypnotized me easily. I guess I've got a weak will or something. Well, then what did you... I was I... lying to you. I was hypnotized, all right. I happened to see your picture here in the house. I recognized you as Berg. And now I can't clear myself before the law ever. And you're going to pay for doing that to me now. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't shoot. Now, look, look, look. Here, here. I have a watch. See it? Solid gold inset with diamonds and rubies. It's worth $20,000. It's yours if you'll let me go. Stop dangling it that way. What are you trying to do? Now, listen to me. Give me another minute. A minute by the watch. Uh, stay where you are and I don't move. You... You don't want to shoot, do you, my friend? You wouldn't want to smash this beautiful, lustrous watch. A golden, shining little timepiece. You can't take your eyes from it, can you? Please, don't. I'll take it away. It's shining in my eyes. But you love it. You're fascinated by it, aren't you? And now you're tired. You're very tired. And that gun is much too heavy for you to hold. Just drop the gun to the floor. And it won't be so heavy anymore. Just... Drop the gun. Drop the gun. My control is perfect. Here, take this notebook and this pencil. Take notebook, pencil. Right as I dictate. I am wanted for the murder of two people at the Fleming house. I wanted to murder two people at Fleming house. They are bound to get me, so I take this way out. Hey. Are bound to get me. Take way out. Sign your name. There. Now give me the notebook and the pencil. Now pick up your gun again. Hurry. That's it. Now put the barrel of the gun in your mouth. Put the barrel of the gun in your mouth. Good. Now pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. How is he, Sheriff? He's dead. Uh, we just made it in time. I didn't think he'd try anything like that. Vince. Mm. Mm. Vince. Come out mm. of it, boy. Uh, I'm all right. It's just... And everything's hazy. Fleming really threw a trance on you. Mm. You were just going to blow your own head off when I plugged Fleming. <clears throat> Had to. Only way I could break the spell in time to save you. You shot Fleming? Cliff, did I do it all right? Did I do everything you told me to do all right? Perfect. I had a hunch it was hypnosis the minute you told me about the candle. But how was I going to prove it? Only by having you come up against Fleming. That's why I left you here. Wagner and I were in the basement with a dictaphone. We put a microphone in the ventilator. I didn't want to make you nervous. That's why I didn't tell you about it. Then I'm... I'm free? I, I won't be tried for murder? Not around here, you won't. I'm sheriff here. This crime is solved. Oh, thank heaven for that. I don't think I could go through a court trial. One nightmare in a lifetime is enough. <laughs> was Nightmare. Tonight's performance in a mystery playhouse. And now, for heaven's sake, let's get off that nightmare. Let's walk down to the green room, huh? For a gander at what sweetness and light is in store for you next time. <laughs> always sweet, always light. You know what? <laughs> Our players are rehearsing there, so follow me, please. Come. Come, come. <laughs> it would have been hard to convince Anne at first. Easy enough for me to say, we have to get rid of Oli. But Oli was Anna's brother. We talked it over on the cliff near the land. 
We have to, Anna. We have to go through with it. Oh, Richard, there must be some other way. The way things are now, everything's hopeless. You know that. With the paint formula cleared, we can be married. Richard, I love you so much. I'd do anything for us. But, but this, this is... Murder? Huh. You needn't look at it that way, darling. So far as you're concerned, Oli will just, uh, disappear. But suppose something goes wrong. Suppose you're convicted. Not a chance. You can't convict a man for murder until you find the body. Oh. And they'll never find Oli. We must, Anna. We must. Very well, Richard. When? When will you... The moment Oli finishes the formula. It's almost ready now. I'll have to do it that instant to make my alibi hold. Today, tomorrow, soon, anyhow. Everything else is ready. I love you above everything else in the world, Richard. I love you enough for even... Uh, Have a peanut, friend? No. No, I'm snoozing, huh? Traveling on trains makes some people sleepy. Not me. Been on trains all my life. Never get sleepy. Going far? Satan's Point, Maine. Satan's Point? Never heard of it. Must be a devil of a small place. <laughs> what I said. Satan's Point. Devil of a small place. Good, huh? Have a peanut? <laughs> Devil of a place. <laughs> Devil of a place. Devil of a place. Devil of a place it was that day. We went over every detail again and again until our story was perfect. A lot depended on the story we constructed. A lot depended on telling it well. I told it well. To the police in Maine and to the alienists in Boston. I started the story with the morning of October 11th. In Oli's laboratory by machine. Let's hold on. This is my last mixture. It will be ready in a few minutes, and I want your eyes to be well rested. Think you've got it this time, Oli? No, there's no longer any doubt. When these pigments are mixed, I will paint a square board. It will look like a dirty green to my eyes. And to mine? To yours, and those of millions of others who are colorblind. Red. Red that you have only imagined till now. Red of the rose, red of a sunset, red of fire, red of blood. I put the blindfold on. I could sense all his tenseness. He'd worked 15 years to make this moment arrive. But just from all I can see, a miracle is about to take place. But I confess to one great fear. What's that, Ollie? I'm not afraid the formula is wrong. I'm afraid for you. For me? Yes. I have to warn you, Richard. I don't know. No one knows what mental reaction takes place when a person who has never seen color before suddenly does. You... You mean that I could be affected? You could be. You see, red excites even normal people. It vibrates in the brain. With you. Let's have a look, Holy. Now, Richard. When you take the blindfold off, look straight ahead of you. The board is right before your eyes. Look, Richard. And when you do, start talking right away. I want your immediate reaction. Okay, here it goes. Look. See, Richard. Look at red. Look. Say something. Talk, Richard. Talk. Say something I couldn't. It's hard enough to recall the little that I do. I was staring straight ahead of me at a square board. Nothing happened for a brief instant. And then... I caught my breath sharply. My eyes dried. They burned. I closed them, but the patch of exquisite color seared my brain. A single hot flashing stab of pain pierced my head. And then I felt a surging power, a physical power, grip me. Talk. And Oli's voice reached me, jabbed at me. My whole being seemed to focus on his voice. I had to choke it off. I instantly recall reaching for him across something and finding his throat. And then... Then nothing more. Nothing but the breaking of glass and a sensation of violent action. Motion and action that lasted long after the voice stopped.
Then I felt cold air lashing at me. I was carrying something limp and heavy. There's a point of rock outside the house. It juts over the sea. I stood there for I don't know how long. The first clear thing I recall is identifying Anna's voice coming toward me. Something died in me. I sagged to the ground, moaning. Anna. Anna, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. What do you suppose all this is, huh? Sounds like somebody got themselves murdered, doesn't it? Well, hmm. that was an appetizer for our next mystery or prey. Mm. And that old master ship. The laughing boy of the inner sanctum, Raymond, is going to serve it up to you. Mm, yes. Raymond's going to be here next time in company with his fellow creeps in another attempt to scare the living daylights out of you. So why not humor the old creep and be around when we open the Squeaking door to the inner sanctum. Mm-hmm. This is Peter Lorry closing the doors of the mystery playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio